Good morning. This hearing will come to order. Less than seven months ago, the administration announced that they delay that they would delay the employer mandate for a year. They acknowledged that when many what many had been saying since the law passed, the employer mandate is bad for business and in turn bad for American workers. While the administration offered a brief reprieve from the employer mandate, the pain Obamacare is inflicting both on job creators and hardworking Americans is only getting worse. As the President prepares to deliver his State of the Union speech tonight, he will likely and appropriately discuss pressing issues facing millions of Americans, such as unemployment, education, and economic opportunity. However, what will be missing is the admission that the President's signature policy achievement is forcing Americans to lose their jobs, have their wages cut, and taking educators out of the classroom. The law is increasing costs for families and individuals already struggling in this economy. Specifically, the 30-hour rule in the health care law, which is the topic of the hearing today, is forcing employers to make the tough decision of cutting hours and workers and preventing them from growing their businesses. The people hit the hardest by the law are not bankers, lawyers, and doctors. They are the single mothers working a restaurant job, the college students paying for their own education by working at the local grocery store, or the firefighters living down the street. In fact, a report by the University of California Berkeley Center for Labor Research and Education concluded, and I quote, those at highest risk, those at highest risk are workers in predominantly low-wage industries that are right on the cusp of what is considered full-time work under the law, end quote. These are Americans living paycheck to paycheck, who are already paying more for food and more for their health care, and are now being hurt again by the burdens of the President's health care law. According to a new Hoover Institution study, the 30-hour rule will affect over 2.6 million workers making on average under $30,000 per year. And almost 90% of those impacted do not have college degrees. I'm sure every member that sits here today has heard stories from families who have had their hours cut and are now forced to make tough financial decisions. A faculty member at a community college in my district wrote to me recently and said, and I'm quoting here, I hold two part-time positions. Today I was informed I cannot continue to do both jobs because of Obamacare laws. Beginning in August, I will no longer be advising and will lose approximately a third of my income. Last year I bought a house, a house I now fear I will no longer be able to afford. Another one of the people I represent in Michigan told his story of struggling to find a job as a result of the law, writing, and I'm quoting here, I'm currently unemployed and seeking work in our greater mid-Michigan area. After looking for employment for some time now, I've discovered I have a common theme among many hiring companies in the area, part-time work positions only available. From what I understand, many employers are now reducing hours, changing full-time positions into multiple part-time staffing as to avoid the ACA. I hope today we can move past the denial that this law does not have an effect on jobs. When I read story after story of how the 30-hour rule is cutting hours for adjunct professors, cutting hours for part-time firefighters, for hourly workers, and for low-income Americans struggling to make ends meet, it's hard to deny the reality that this law is hurting average Americans. The White House does not want to believe it, but we need to understand that the problem is real. Republicans are working towards solutions so hardworking Americans do not have to worry about their hours and wages being cut as a result of Obamacare. Todd Young's legislation, the Save America and Workers Act, would repeal the 30-hour definition of full-time employment and restore the traditional 40-hour definition so we can have more Americans working full-time jobs. Getting Americans working again, or at least restoring the number of hours they used to be able to work, should not be a partisan issue. Both parties should be able to come together to ensure that we remove barriers to job growth and wage increases. The best thing we could do is repeal the entire law, but that cannot and should not deter us from looking at specific pieces of the law, which is what we'll do today. Before I recognize Ranking Member Levin for the purpose of an opening statement, I ask unanimous consent that all members' written statements be included in the, rec in the record. And without objection, so ordered. I now recognize Ranking Member Levin for his opening statement. Thank you very much and welcome, if I might, a special welcome to Dr. Levy from the University of Michigan. Mr. Kemp and I have a special hello to you. Yes. <laughs> To this, today, this committee is holding a hearing on an issue that has been rehashed many times, yet has failed to have a single hearing on an issue also in our jurisdiction 
that already has directly affected the lives of 1.6 million people, their total loss of unemployment insurance. A small percentage of employers, less than 1%, will be affected by the employer responsibility provision in the ACA. But more than 1.6 million long-term unemployed are facing right now the loss of their benefits, their cars, their homes. I met last week at home with 25 long-term unemployed workers to hear their stories. One of them, Josie Masano of St. Clair Shores, Michigan, is here today and will be my guest at the State of the Union tonight. This hearing should be for us listening to her story and the stories of so many others, including that just mentioned by our chairman. Instead, we are here today so that the majority continue its endless pursuit of undermining a law that is already helping millions and is here to stay. <clears throat> today, the majority brings us together to discuss the impact of ACA on jobs, employers, and the economy. Here's what they are un unlikely to say. <clears throat> First, a very small percentage of employers, less than 1%, will be affected by the so-called employer mandate provision within the law. Not only does it apply to businesses with 50 or more employees, making 95% of businesses exempt, all but 5% of businesses with more than 50 employees already offer their employees health insurance. Providing employee coverage is both economic and a standard of business practice for businesses with more than 50 employees. In fact, this is why we use 50 employees as the cutoff for an exempt small business. It has been that way for years, and few expect that to change as a result of ACA. Indeed, a recent sur survey found that 99% of employers will continue to offer coverage. In a real-world experience, that shows that employer-sponsored insurance in Massachusetts has increased since the state reforms. Two, since the Affordable Care Act was signed into law four years ago, private employers have added more than 8 million jobs. More than 90% of the rise in employment nationwide has been due to workers in full-time jobs. In fact, workers in the restaurant industry have seen their average weekly hours increase since the law was signed, contrary to the notion that there has been a widespread shift to reduce hours in that sector. Those who have threatened to cut hours in response to the law have been making such threats more than a year before the law was in effect. Third, the Affordable Care Act is good for individuals who have dreamed of starting their own business or taking the risk to change jobs and help grow a small business. These entrepreneurs, like the three million people who have enrolled now, can get private health insurance through the federal and state-based marketplaces. But unfortunately, for 1.6 million job-seeking Americans, the last time this full committee met for a hearing on a topic other than the Affordable Care Act was on July 18, six months and 10 days ago. Hope springs eternal that this committee can restore its focus to the broad range of issues under our jurisdiction, which have the power to create economic growth and opportunity for our nation and all our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levin. I now want to welcome our panel of witnesses. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Lonnie J. Chen, a research fellow for the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. And second, we will hear from Peter Anastas, the owner and co-founder of the Main Course Hospitality Group. And third, we will hear from Neil Troutwine, Vice President Employee Benefits Council at the National Retail Federation. Fourth, we will hear from Thomas J. Snyder, the President of Ivy Tech Community College. And finally, we'll hear from Helen Levy, a research associate professor at the University of Michigan. And thank you all for being with us today. 
The committee has received each of your written statements. Uh, they will be made part of the formal hearing record. Each of you will be recognized for five minutes for your oral testimony, and Mr. Chen will begin with you. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Levin, and members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to appear before you today to discuss the Affordable Care Act and the impact of its employer mandate's definition of full-time employee on jobs and opportunities. My name is Lon He Chen. I'm a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, a lecturer in public policy, and a lecturer in law at Stanford University. The Affordable Care Act as a whole creates significant disincentives for businesses to grow and hire workers. And no element of the law is more onerous in this regard than its employer mandate. And within the mandate, no provision is more controversial or more harmful to workers who can least afford it than the law's definition of a full-time employee as someone who works an average of 30 hours per week. This seemingly small provision creates large incentives for employers to reduce the hours of employment for some workers. I argue that the 30-hour rule is harmful for three reasons, and I'll briefly discuss each of these arguments. First, the 30-hour rule hurts precisely those workers who can least afford to be hurt. Second, it creates additional costs and administrative complexities for employers which will prevent them from growing their businesses. And finally, it uniquely hurts educational opportunities by adversely affecting both workers and students in school districts, colleges, and universities. First, the ACA's 30-hour rule adversely affects those who can least afford to be hurt. Currently, 7.8 million Americans are working part-time but want full-time work. Indeed, the 30-hour rule makes it more unlikely that these Americans can get the jobs they want and need. Chairman uh, Camp mentioned earlier a study from the University of California at Berkeley, which found that about 2 million Americans are part of a vulnerable population to have their hours reduced as a result of the ACA's 30-hour rule. My colleagues and I at the Hoover Institution recently updated and refined this study to conclude that 2.6 million Americans are in danger because of the 30-hour rule. Our research also found that the 30-hour rule disproportionately harms women, those without a college degree, young Americans, and the poor. The industries most likely to be harmed are workers working in the retail trade, restaurants, accommodation, building services, and nursing homes. This matches up indeed with the anecdotal information we're receiving from employers. One media outlet reported in December of 2013 that 388 employers have already restricted work hours to below 30 hours per week because of the ACA's 30-hour rule. Notable examples include SeaWorld Entertainment, David's Bridal, several Subway restaurants, franchisees, and Land's End. Regal Entertainment Group, which operates more than 500 movie theaters across 38 states, cut hours for non-salaried workers to stay below the 30-hour threshold. And indeed, this phenomenon is not limited to the private sector. In the public sector, municipalities and states from my home state of California in Long Beach to your home state, Mr. Chairman, and Ranking Member Levin of Michigan, the city of Auburn Hills, have reduced uh, the number of hours for part-time employees in order to deal with the ACA's 30-hour rule. Secondly, the ACA's creation of a separate rule governing the definition of a full-time employee creates added administrative complexities and costs for employers. These added costs and complexities may create disincentives for hiring and growth. The 30-hour rule creates additional health benefit costs for employers. Indeed, those employers who currently offer health insurance to all of their full-time employees and intend to continue doing so will face added costs. And given the individual mandate and what we expect to be higher premiums on the exchanges, employers may see many of their employees opting for health insurance, further raising their costs. Employers also face significant new record-keeping and reporting requirements in complying with the 30-hour rule. Regulatory guidance issued recently by the Internal Revenue Service mandates complicated calculations and record keeping regarding an employee's hours of service. The rules differ by whether employees are new or ongoing, and in the case of new employees, whether they're expected to work full time or are variable or seasonal employees. Even those employees that, employers, excuse me, that provide health coverage to all of their full time employees are now required to track and record those hours of service in a way that is potentially onerous and complicated. Finally, the 30-hour rule must be addressed because of the negative impact it has on school districts, colleges, and universities. Indeed, about 225,000 workers in the educational industry face having their hours cut because of the ACA's 30-hour rule, 
and a recent analysis revealed that 100 school districts alone, including dozens in Indiana, have either cut worker hours or outsourced jobs to deal with the ACA's employer mandate. In sum, Mr. Chairman, the 30-hour rule in the Affordable Care Act has impacts that reach far beyond our health care system. Its negative effect on jobs and economic opportunities are of greatest concern to me. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Levin, and members of the committee, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chen. Mr. Anastas, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Camp, Ranking Member Levin, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the impact of the employer mandate's definition of full-time employee on jobs and opportunities. My name is Peter Anastas, and I'm an owner and co-founder of Main Course Hospitality Group, which owns and operates and manages a dozen hotels in northern New England. We currently have three new hotels under construction, two of which are owned by others, in Bangor and Portland, Maine, and Burlington, Vermont. Our portfolio includes Marriott and Hilton-branded hotels, which we operate under franchise agreements, as well as two independent hotels. Approximately 300 people are currently employed by MCHG, which will expand to over 500 people in the next 18 months. I appear here today on behalf of Main Course Hospitality Group and the International Franchise Association. As a large employer under the Affordable Care Act, my business is already at a disadvantage compared to sim smaller hotels, which are not required to offer health coverage to employees. Before the Affordable Care Act passed, we had a health benefits plan in place that offered coverage to any employee working 30 hours or more per week. And I plan to continue to offer that same plan with the same eligibility requirements. You might wonder why I'm here today to speak in opposition to a mandate that I followed before it was codified into law. The answer is that combined with other harmful aspects of the employer mandate, this definition of full-time employee is, is what is going to more than double, in fact, maybe even triple my costs in the next year alone. Businesses such as mine will have far less funds available to expand their businesses, which would have created opportunities for employers and employees alike. Beginning this year, individuals who do not obtain coverage will be subject to a tax penalty under the individual mandate. As the tax penalty increases in the coming years, more of my eligible employees will enroll in the company plan. We are taking on more costs per insured employee, employee than ever before, and we are insuring more employees than ever before. My employees are now forced to choose between enrolling in an expensive employer health plan or enrolling in a plan in the health insurance marketplace without the assistance of a premium tax credit. Many of my competitors have already made significant workforce changes in order to manage costs under the law. Those that are large employers are reducing hours of variable hour employees to less than 30 hours per week so as to avoid employer mandate requirements. As a result, my competitors will be able to offer lower prices to customers and guests. I realize that if the threshold were raised to 40 hours, some employers may simply lower their employees to 39 hours or fewer. But I would submit that losing one hour of work and, and going, into it, going to an exchange is not nearly as bad as losing 11 hours of work, 27.5% of your work, and going to an exchange. We refuse to do that to our business or our workers, so our only option is to work within the law while advocating for common sense changes that make the law more workable for small business owners. Keeping these priorities in mind, one option I have is to keep my workers who currently work 30 hours per week or more at or above that mark while keeping my workers currently below 30 hours per week below that mark. This will create a division of my workforce that any smart manager would like to avoid. We want to reward our best workers with extra hours, and this is a perverse incentive not to do that. As we build new hotel locations in Maine and Vermont this year, we will most likely bring on employees that will work below 30 hours per week initially. While this situation is not ideal for hiring the best workers, it is all I can do to keep myself in business while maintaining my commitment to my current employees. Although the White House maintains that the Affordable Care Act does not increase part-time work, a recent study of franchise owners by the International Franchise Association revealed that 31% of franchise owners have already reduced work hours and 27% have already re replaced full-time workers with part-time ones, a full year before the empl employer mandate is set to take effect. With fewer hours and less take-home pay, workers who have had their hours cut are not only ineligible for employer-sponsored coverage, they are also less able to afford their own coverage. For decades, employees have used the 40-hour work week as a standard for workforce management. The ACA's provision requiring employees to provide coverage to full-time employees 
and defining a full-time work week as 30 hours will cause many employers to simply manage their employees to fewer hours. Not only has the employer mandate discouraged job creation and business expansion, it has also damaged existing jobs by including a misguided statutory requirement that discarded more than a half a century of established labor policy. Even though the employer mandate has been delayed for one year, key changes are still necessary to help franchises and other small businesses implement the law. Several pieces of legislation have been introduced to redefine the full-time employee as one who works at least 40 hours per week. The 40 hours is a full-time act and Save American Workers Act will accomplish this goal. I believe that if some key changes are made, employers will shift their attention from trying to find ways around the employer mandate to trying to find ways to maintain financial stability while covering the deserving workers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Anastas. Mr. Troutwine, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Camp, Ranking Member Levin, and honored members of the committee. Good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you this morning to discuss our continuing concerns regarding ACA implementation and more specifically the 30-hour rule for determining full-time employment. NRF is the world's largest retail trade association representing retailers large, small, and in-between chain restaurants, grocers, and internet retailers. Retail is the nation's largest private sector employer, supporting one in four U.S. jobs, 42 million working Americans. We believe that it's long past time to address specific problems with the ACA, like the 30-hour definition. NRF will work with anyone willing to make changes to this law beneficial to the industries we represent and the employees of those companies. We do credit the regulatory agencies for working hard and fairly cooperatively to implement the provisions. The administration early on focused on our industries because of the frequently variable nature of retail employment. Many employees don't fit neatly into full and part-time categories. Compliance will be particularly challenging. The segment of our workforce tends to be more mobile and changes jobs uh, frequently. Sometimes they work for multiple establishments, so compliance is particularly challenging. Many of the regulatory approaches developed in response to the challenges of our workforce, such as the look back and stability period approach developed by the Department of Treasury, <coughs> uh, have in turn bred additional complexity. One truly significant challenge is the ACA's definition of full-time for coverage eligibility at 30 hours per week on average. NRF strongly supports the bipartisan interest in this issue and legislation like H.R. 2575, the Save American Workers Act. We respectfully urge that this bill and others to address specific shortcomings in the ACA be enacted sooner than later. Later may be too late. Changing the 30-hour definition is common sense. If asked, most Americans would assume full-time to be 40 hours per week. A 30-hour definition forces retailers to manage to an unfamiliar standard, whether somebody is working to 40 hours, whether somebody is above or below 30 hours per week. Retail and chain restaurants will be forced to fine-tune the balance between full and part-time, focusing on employee status on a real-time basis. For variable hour employees who do not meet the new full-time standard, this will mean less income in their pockets and consequently less likelihood of obtaining coverage on their own. Retailers are considering their options in advance of 2015, but technically the counting for look-back purposes should have already started on January 1st if they had a one-year look-back. Ultimately, it'll be the existing part-time workforce of great importance to the industries I represent that will feel the greatest effect of the 30-hour definition. Again, NRF greatly appreciates the opportunity to appear before you today. We strongly urge this committee and the Congress to consider specific changes to the ACA, including the definition 
of full-time employment. It's in our best interest to keep our employees healthy and at work, but not at any cost. The ACA will, at a minimum, pressure our ability to continue to provide coverage and help drive positive change in the workforce. We hope to work with you to help make the ACA more workable so long as it remains the law of this land. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Troutline. I would now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Young, for the purposes of introducing our next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's, it's my honor and pleasure today to welcome to this committee a fellow Hoosier. Tom Snyder is president of Ivy Tech Community College, our statewide community college system, which is the largest of its kind in the country. President Snyder has been in his role since 2007, leading Ivy Tech. Uh, they have more than 200,000 students in our state, 30 campuses, and 100 learning centers. Tom, I thank you for coming here today to testify and look forward to hearing how this new definition of full-time is affecting our adjunct professors and the students you serve. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Snyder, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak with you on behalf of Ivy Tech and our 200,000 students and nearly 8,000 faculty and staff. We also want to thank you, Chairman Camp and Ranking Member Levin, for scheduling the hearings on this important matter. And separately, we'd like to thank Representative Young, along with Representative Kind and Representative Paulson, for sponsoring the bill to repeal the medical device tax with the goal of protecting thousands of very high paying jobs, not only in Indiana, but across America. As you have stated, Mr. Chairman, we must be working together to remove obstacles for individuals seeking full-time work. Our focus at Ivy Tech, as it is for community colleges all across the country, is to prepare students for future careers. The community college structure, unique to the United States, is our country's most affordable and accessible option to higher education. If we are to close the global attainment gap, we must do all we can to keep it both affordable and accessible. Indiana, as was said, is a one statewide community college, the largest system in the country with campuses across the state. We are open admission with a wide variation in college preparedness. We have some students entering right after high school. Others are doing a career change and entering at age 30 or 40 or 50 or even older. Indiana's public colleges, among them, Ivy Tech has more than one half of all Pell Grant recipients and Ivy Tech has more than one half of all African Americans in public colleges. For many of these students, Ivy Tech is their best chance in life to get an education needed for today's workforce. And I would argue that the community college system is more critical than most any other institution in rebuilding America's middle class. One of our keys to this success is our adjunct faculty team of more than 4,500. Most are practitioners in their field working full-time in another job, bringing their real-life, real-time experiences to the classroom. Moreover, these adjuncts are very often the individuals that we would consider for full-time positions. In fact, over the last four years, we have placed more than 500 adjuncts into full-time faculty or staff positions. I also want to be very clear that we are firm supporters of ensuring Americans have broader access to health care. However, I want to highlight a couple serious issues related to the 30-hour rule. We are very pleased that this bill authored by Congressman Young will bring some clarity and a possible solution to the 30-hour problem. The Affordable Care Act has caused us to reevaluate teaching hours for our adjunct faculty. We've done this with very limited guidance. Like most community colleges, our funding does not provide for any large unfunded mandate such as the ACA 30-hour rule. The annual impact on us would be 10 to $12 million, with a total statewide health care bill today of $25 million, so a 50% increase. The penalty provisions we could face for exceeding 30 hours, knowing we have thousands of adjuncts all over the state, is not an option we could even consider. Moreover, a very little known effect is the IRS has said prep and preparation time must be considered. We are just not how to sure how to factor in preparation time for 4,500 adjuncts, adjuncts or what other aspects must be included in this determination. So to be cautious, we have limited the hours of adjunct faculty that they can teach. All of this results in having to find more adjunct faculty to meet student demand, which really results in another challenge, the lack of additional credential faculty causing classes to be canceled and students turned away. 
The uncertainty of implementing the 30-hour rule has impacted colleges across the country, but none more dramatically than the community college system. The end result may be less student access and the inability of faculty to stay with one college. Some of our adjuncts have taken positions at other institutions to fill the financial gap, inadvertently reducing the exposure to full-time faculty opportunities in the future. If, as proposed, 40 hours would be the measurement for full-time, it would allow institutions much more flexibility. We would still need further guidance and clarity on how to treat hours such as preparation time, a very difficult issue. But we would be able to manage the process much easier than today. This is a critical discussion. This is about ensuring that we are able to provide the best educational product at Ivy Tech while protecting the jobs of our adjunct faculty. At Ivy Tech, we strive to have the right resources in the right place to educate hundreds of thousands of Hoosiers for the jobs of the future. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Ms. Levy, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Camp, Ranking Member Levin, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Helen Levy. I am an economist at the University of Michigan with appointments at the university's Institute for Social Research, School of Public Health, and Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I am addressing you today not on behalf of the university, but as a researcher with expertise in health insurance and labor markets. As we've heard, there is considerable concern that the 30 hours requirement in the Affordable Care Act could create an incentive for employers to keep their workers' hours below 30. Research suggests that this concern has been overstated and that one proposed change increasing the full-time threshold to 40 hours would actually make the problem much worse. The best evidence we have on the labor market impact of an insurance mandate with an hours threshold comes from Hawaii, where all employers have been required since the mid-1970s to provide coverage to employees who work 20 hours or more per week. A recent study shows that if you compare Hawaiian workers to the rest of the U.S., you see that the result of this mandate has been an increase in employer-sponsored in employer health insurance, no significant effect on overall employment, and a small increase in the probability of part-time work in Hawaii compared to the rest of the U.S. The effect on part-time work represents an increase of 1.4 percentage points in the fraction of employment that is part-time. To put that number in perspective, currently about 19% of the U.S. workforce is part-time. This is a small effect relative to the size of the labor market, but concern about potential cutbacks in hours because of the ACA's 30-hour rule have led some to propose shifting the cutoff to 40 hours instead. This approach would actually make the potential problem much worse. Here's why. There are many more uninsured workers near the 40-hour threshold than near the 30-hour threshold. Three recent independent studies have all looked at this issue and reached the same basic conclusion. If you think about the number of workers who are potentially at risk of having their hours cut, and you look just above 30 hours, as Mr. Chen described in his testimony, um, there are, according to his calculations, about 2.5 million of these vulnerable workers right around the 30 hours threshold. Other studies have put the number a little bit lower, around 850,000. The point is that if you look at how many of these vulnerable workers are near the 40-hour threshold, if you move the threshold, there are about three times as many workers who would be vulnerable at that higher level because there are just so many more workers who work 40 hours than 30 hours. So the bottom line effect of changing the full-time threshold to 40 hours would be to place many more uninsured workers potentially at risk of having their hours cut. This change would also increase federal spending on Medicaid and on premium tax credits. Thinking beyond the 30-hour rule, we might also ask how the coverage provisions of the ACA as a whole are likely to affect the labor market. The best research on this question comes from Massachusetts, where comprehensive reform similar to the Affordable Care Act was implemented in 2007. The evidence from Massachusetts is clear. There has been no decline in employment or hours relative to neighboring states, even in industries that are generally low wage, such as accommodation, food services, and retail. It is also important not to overlook the fact that healthcare reform is likely to have important benefits for labor markets, largely by alleviating the problem of job lock. If you can get affordable insurance without working full time for a large firm, 
This makes it easier for entrepreneurs to start their own businesses, as Mr. Levin mentioned. It also makes it easier for parents of young children or workers nearing retirement to choose part-time work without worrying about not being able to get health insurance. The Congressional Budget Office has projected that the Affordable Care Act would reduce employment in 2021 by about one-half of one percent. If this were an estimate of the increase in the number of individuals unemployed as a result of the ACA, that would be alarming indeed, but this is not the correct interpretation of CBO's projection. CBO is very clear that most of this effect is due to changes in labor supply, things like the older workers cutting back on the hours and not labor demand, which is things like firms limiting their workers' hours. From an economic perspective or from the perspective of common sense, it is inaccurate to characterize these voluntary reductions in labor supply as job killing. In conclusion, the best research we have suggests that the ACA is likely to have very little effect on labor demand relative to the size of the labor market, and it is likely to have significant positive effects as well. I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Levy, and thank you all for your testimony this morning. Uh, Mr. Chen, I'd like to try to quantify the impact this rule can have on an individual worker. For example, if a restaurant worker normally works 36 hours and the ACA reduces them to 29, they've lost seven hours per week. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, this worker has an average wage of $13.66 per hour. So. My calculations are that because of Obamacare, this worker just took the equivalent of a 20% pay, pay cut. Um, my question is, how does a 30-hour rule impact a part-time firefighter? Um, there are reports that many local communities are cutting back or planning to cut back the hours of part-time firefighters as a result of the ACA. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the 30-hour the rule has a significant impact on uh, someone like a part-time firefighter. A firefighter earns an average of about $22 an hour. If the part-time firefighter works 39 hours a week, uh, he or she will earn $848. If the firefighter's hours are cut back to 29, he or she would lose about two, uh, $217, which is roughly a 30% pay cut. If the hours are cut from 35 to 29, uh, the firefighter's looking at roughly a 17% pay cut. So obviously the incentive to reduce those hours would be particularly damaging for the part-time firefighter. I think it's really an example of how complicated the 30-hour rule really is and how misguided it is in application. The administration has said that they're going to fix this for volunteer firefighters, which is certainly welcome, but we still have not seen any actual regulations or any details on how they plan to do that. But many local communities employ part-time firefighters, and in many cases, they're second jobs. Um, so they're not doing it for the health care. They're individuals who are taking on this very dangerous work. And um, many communities uh, use part-time firefighters for different reasons. Sometimes they're needed for 15 hours. Sometimes they're needed for 35 hours, and it often can't be predicted. So the rule, this rule is forcing local communities who can't afford to offer health insurance to them to impose a very rigid schedule, um, which may not be in line with the needs of the community. And I just want to mention what the fire chief for the Grand Traverse Metro Emergency Services Authority said in northern Michigan just last month, and I'm quoting, we're going to have to find the money somewhere or do more with less on the fire scene. <clears throat> and I don't think any of us have that luxury. <clears throat> the last thing I want to say to an employee is, you've met your hours for the week, you can't come on an emergency. Not only would that hurt them, but it would hurt us as we need those people to respond on calls. So Mr. Chen, in your testimony, you reference new research by the Hoover Institute. The research shows this rule impacts 2.6 million Americans, 89% of whom don't have a college degree, and a median income of under $30,000. Could you explain in more detail who this population is and why the 30-hour hits lower-income Americans so much harder than the rest of the population? The research that we've conducted is an update of the study uh, from the University of California at Berkeley, and we take the same definition of a vulnerable population that they do. Uh, one can quibble with that definition, but we've decided simply to update it. The definition of a vulnerable worker, uh, someone between the age of 19 to 64, currently working between 30 and 36 hours, um, family income below 400 percent of federal poverty, which would make them eligible for the uh, subsidies, the cost-sharing subsidies in the Affordable Care Act, 
uh, and who do not currently receive health insurance from their employers. Uh, when you take all of that uh, data and you crunch the numbers, what you end up with, as you said, Mr. Chairman, is approximately 2.6 million workers who are in danger of having their hours cut. That's approximately 3% of the U.S. workforce. With respect to why it's particularly dangerous for these individuals, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's because of the fact that they are at an income level which is highly vulnerable. There's some discussion about moving to the 40-hour threshold and the impact that would have. The reality is you're looking at different categories of workers. At the 30-hour threshold, the worker is far more vulnerable from an income perspective than at the 40-hour threshold. Therefore, uh, the vulnerable population clearly is one that the ACA's 30-hour rule has the potential to hit quite hard. All right, thank you. Uh, I now recognize Ranking Member Levin for, for his questioning. Thank you and welcome. Let me just read something from an analysis of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and I ask that this be placed in the record. And it uh, covers the testimony of yours, Dr. Levy. Moreover, raising the law's threshold for full-time work from 30 to, uh, hours a week to 40 would make a shift towards part-time employment much more likely, not less so. That's because only a small share of workers today, less than 8 percent, work 30 to 34 hours a week and thus are most at risk of having their hours cut below health reforms threshold. In comparison, 43 percent of employees work 40 hours a week and another several uh, percent work 41 to 44 hours a week. Thus, raising the threshold to 40 hours would place more than five times as many workers at risk of having their hours reduced. Do any of you challenge that? You do? Mr. Anderson? Just, uh, Congressman Levin, to go from for an employer who's not offering insurance, and he goes from 40 hours to 39 is barely a move at all, whereas if you go from 40, it's to save all that money, you certainly, you certainly would be looking at lowering the amount of, uh, at, at lowering the amount of people you have at that level that you had to insure them. That's those people that don't insure them. But I, I certainly, I, I, in all due respect, it just seems like it, it flies in the face of um, almost rationality that if if the, it was 30 hours a week, people would not be managing to that level to save so much money. We're, we're not, it, it's just a large, it's a large portion, the health care is such a large portion of how much we have to pay to be doubling and tripling our, our cost, our health care costs, and to, then, and to then say if you go over 30 hours, I mean we want to reward those people over 30 hours, but you're going to artificially keep them down at that level. Yeah, but that doesn't sort of challenge the statement. That, that in terms of the number of people you put at risk, look, and I represent uh, community colleges, one of the largest in the nation. People who work 35 hours, how do they get insurance? Don't, don't you want them insured? Um, uh, Representative Levin, I think the issue for the community college is our unique structure of building a uh, partnership in the community and requiring uh, both because of cost and because of, of uh, vision to have half the uh, faculty be on an adjunct part-time basis, okay, but most but of whom have full insurance and full-time jobs. And well, then, then, then and at another you, level. all you have to do is offer and they refuse. It's not going to increase your cost in most cases. We've I done mean, enough. You, we've for done, those, for right. those who work 35, 36, 37 hours and don't have insurance, don't you want them covered? So the, the issue at the community college is that, uh, as, as we've done right now, we've reduced the, the credit load, which is actually the classroom load, to nine hours or three classes. And the reason that we've done that is that we are very likely to have a preparation time mandate that we either have to justify internally by having data on all 4,500 adjuncts or rely on an outside party, okay. how many hours of work outside the classroom. But that's an issue that has to be worked out. But well, you say in your testimony you want people covered. 
We want people covered. Okay. Now, if they work 35 hours, 36 hours, and they don't have insurance, do you want them covered? I think in general everybody in the country wants people that okay. are working so, virtually so, full-time. So if they don't have insurance, if, if, if their spouse works and they have insurance, they'll turn it down. It won't cost you anything. You say you want them to have insurance. They work 35, 36, 37 hours. You're not going to, you don't want to have to cover them. So who's going to cover them? You know, our concept really regarding our adjuncts is that they are part-time, and our expectation is we do not plan to give them insurance because we do not plan to work them 35 hours. The issue is that the bulk of the time that is counted is time outside of our control. It's preparation time. Okay, but that's an issue that has to be worked out. But that is the biggest issue for the community. Okay, college. so then it should be worked out. But for you to say this is the problem with the ACA and with health care reform and all the rhetoric. People say they want everybody covered. You're a community college. People are working 35, 36 hours. The assumption is they don't have health coverage through a spouse. And you're essentially saying you want everybody covered, but you don't want to cover them. We cover people working 35 hours or more with health insurance if they're working outside of the adjunct roles. We cover them today. All right, thank you. Mr. Johnson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Let me tell you about one of my constituents from McKinney, Texas, who is doing her best to make a way for herself. Jillian, a college student in her early 20s, and I'm sure you're familiar with those people, has worked part-time at a local grocery store to help pay for her school expenses. For several years, Jillian clocked between 30 to 40 hours a week, and suddenly she was cut between 15 and 18 hours a week. Julian was shocked and decided to approach her manager. His answer was loud and clear. The cuts are due to Obamacare. The so-called 30-hour rule imposed by Obamacare forced this employer, like many others across the country, to cut worker hours, therefore harming the workers it promised to help. Let's put this into perspective, and I'll be conservative with my calculation. Let's say Julian worked 30 hours a week, and because of Obamacare was cut to 18 hours of work week. That's a loss of 12 working hours. Having worked at the grocery store for a long time, Julian was up to $9 an hour. This meant she was losing $108 a week. Worse, that adds up to more than $430 each month. That's 430 less for her pocket that she uses to pay for textbooks, gas, groceries, and living expenses. Mr. Chin, many people like Jillian and find part-time work to help make ends meet. How does the 30-hour rule impact waiters and waitresses? Uh, Congressman, it has a severe impact on individuals who are employed as, as waiters or waitresses. If you consider that the average uh, wait staff earns about $9 an hour, uh, working 39 hours a week, they would earn approximately $350 a week. If they're cut back to 29 hours, they lose uh, $90 a week, which is roughly a quarter, 26% pay cut. If the worker, uh, if the waiter works 35 hours a week, they earn $300. Uh, if you cut them to 29 hours a week, they lose $54 a week, which is a 17% pay cut. Congressman, the basic point here is that if you make something more expensive, you're going to have less of it. And so that is the dynamic that we see at play here. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nassis, in your testimony, you state that because of the 30-hour rule, Quote, unfortunately for my part-time workers, they will no longer be able to pick up additional shifts when their schedules change or work more hours during busier times to bring home more pay. Can you go into more detail about how this rule impacts the part-time waitresses and waiters that you have managed over the years? Uh, well, Congressman, I got out of the restaurant business and stuck, stuck with the hotels. I found it a lot more profitable. But uh, <laughs> for, our, for our people over – in fact, I'm glad you asked me that question because we were one of the first companies in Maine, hospitality companies, 20 years ago to institute health insurance. We've had it as low as 24 hours. Of course we want to insure people from 30 to 40 hours. But we are two and a half times – uh, our costs are going to go up right now. 
I mean, how much more can we do? So when I have people at 30 hours and I want to reward them with more, sure, but I have to have the viability of our business first. We're small business. I'm not like Apple Computer or some sort of thing. I have like basically 80 room hotels. So you're at a relatively small profit margin. When you're talking about doubling and tripling your health insurance cost, you just there's got to be a point where you just can't do it. So of course you're going to manage down to 30 hours. I'd like to raise them up, but if you're talking about a 10, 12 dollar an hour employee, and then you're going to cost cost four or five thousand just to raise them up a few hours, it makes it extremely difficult to do. And Thank one, you. one last thing: small businesses in in this country. I, I just think sometimes you, we miss the point how. We grow our businesses together from scratch. I mean, I had one hotel 10 years ago. All these people, we know, we know them well. And to drive, I feel like we're driving a wedge between us. And it just, it, it's going to make it so hard when they want more hours to say no to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. or Dr. Chen, uh, doesn't that cause a reduction in Social Security benefits and won't that have an effect on increasing poverty among seniors down the line? That, that certainly potentially could be one side effect, Congressman, uh, given the lower wages uh, and, and therefore the lower uh, payment of taxes into the system. Yes, sir. Affects disability also, does it not? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Rangel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me uh, thank uh, this panel. It's seldom that we get a, a, a panel that, uh, that really believes in health insurance for as many people as possible, and I gather from all of your statements that if the resources were there, you would think that it would be in the best interest of the country to give access to health care for all the workers, right? No one disagrees with that. And I assume there has to be some evidence that a, a, a workforce that does have uh, health care uh, is more productive and has less sick time and less disabilities. I assume that the research would point that out. Now, you have worked, Dr. Chen, with uh, with Governor Romney, uh, where he had some concepts about uh, health insurance. And uh, are there any similarities between the ACA and the the program that Governor Romney supported in Massachusetts? Congressman uh, Rangel, I, I believe that Governor Romney and President Obama share an interest in ensuring uh, that as many Americans receive access to quality health insurance coverage as possible. I have well, no doubt that's that the a general feeling by Americans, but the chair has restricted me to five minutes, and I'd rather talk about the plan rather than the man in terms of yes, sir. the overwhelming belief that it would be good if we could afford it. So what are the similarities between the, the man the men as relates to the plan? Um, certainly there are elements structurally uh, that are similar. I know. That's what I'm asking. And, you. What and are they? The, the creation of health insurance exchanges, uh, the notion of individual responsibility, those are certainly similar between the plans. And the mandates? Uh, pardon me? And the mandates? Uh, the individual mandate as well as the fair share responsibility are. Well, let me are, ask you this then. With those similarities, is there anything that you could suggest that we could do to perfect the ACA in order to get the same type of support, I assume, that you give to Governor Romney's health plan? Governor um, Romney's health plan? I, I would say, Congressman, that the, affordable, the problem with the Affordable Care Act is that it takes a federal approach to what I believe should be state-based reform. So, so what would you suggest, that we repeal the ACA? Yes, sir, I would. How would you go up? I don't know how much political science you've taken in your background and training. But assuming uh, that the overwhelming majority of the people wanted to repeal it, what would be the first step that you would suggest that the Congress would do? Put in a bill to repeal it? Uh, I would suggest the first step would be to have a replacement for it, Congressman, that, that repeal alone would be insufficient. Now, what would happen to the people that have signed up already? Now, we, we're in a repeal mode and we have to sell it, do we cancel out all of the contracts that are out there under the ACA now well, and tell them that in the future we will have a, another plan? Does that make any sense to you as a citizen rather than as a 
uh, expert. Uh, I'd make two points, Congressman. First of all, unfortunately, many Americans have already had their plans canceled. Second of all, but you, what, I'm what talking I would, about the millions of people that just signed up. I think it's important that there be some mechanism to ensure that people who have insurance are able to retain that insurance. Now that's where we want to get some some area of agreement. Could you give any idea, rather than repeal of what we got, because I think most all the Republicans and most of the witnesses, not this panel, of course, believe in repeal. But unlike you, they have the slightest clue as to where do we go with the people who have no insurance. Now, you're saying that those that have signed up on this, that you do have some idea, based on your experience with Governor Romney, that they should be protected. And I agree with you. What would you suggest we do right now besides repeal? Because politically speaking, impeachment is more probable than repeal, and, and that's on the minds of a lot of people, too. So forget that. What can we do to protect those people who signed up under ACA? Uh, Congressman, I would suggest one of the things we can do is fix the 30-hour rule, which we're here talking about what? today. Is, is to fix the 30-hour rule, which is contained no, in the no, employer no, mandate, no, which we're talking no, about. We're talking about people that, that work 40, 50 hours. They're insured now. Don't go into this other group. Those are problems that we can't overcome that we're talking about. I'm talking about protecting the millions of people that had no insurance. They have now signed up 30, 40, 50 hours. And I, as a legislator, have to protect them as I try to perfect the delivery system. You have no ideas as to what happens to them. I, I would suggest one of the problems we have now is that many Americans are unable to afford insurance on the health insurance exchanges because of the structure of the ACA and what's required of plans on the exchanges. Therefore, one of the things I would do to answer your question, Congressman, is I would revisit the essential health benefits requirement in the ACA. All right, thank you. Mr. Brady is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Um, if you don't think this 30-hour mandate isn't hurting workers and cutting hours, you're in deeper denial than Justin Bieber. <laughs> gentleman yield. Would the gentleman yes. yield? You know, I never. He has a Canadian plan that's single Bieber payer. Reference. You know, the head of United uh, Food and Commercial Workers says it is happening. So the facts are already starting to show up. You're seeing workers have their hours reduced and their incomes reduced. And Jimmy Hoffa, not exactly a conservative, has said that this rule will destroy the foundation of the 40-hour work week. It's the backbone of the American middle class. They know it's, it's happening. They're seeing it. I was with a Houston restaurant owner who just got off a conference call with all his store managers and basically told them we will never hire a full-time worker again. Never. We just can't afford it. And this is a successful restaurant owner who likes opening up new restaurants and hiring new workers. We're told today that if we go back to the traditional 40-hour uh, work week, which is, has uh, been the case for many, many decades, that it will actually make the problem worse. But we know that nearly 9 out of 10 workers who have a full-time job are eligible for health care. We know if they're part-time, it's about a 15% chance. So this rules forcing workers into part-time work with less of a chance of health care. So Dr. Chen, what happens if we return to the 40-hour work week? I'm going to ask some of our business people as well. So what happens if we return to a 40-hour work week? What, how does it impact that local worker? Well, I think administratively it's much easier for employers. I mean, bear in mind that the 40-hour work week was originally enshrined in the Fair Labor Standards Act. Even though it does not define full-time employment as 40 hours per week, it does dictate that non-exempt workers are paid overtime once they go over 40 hours. Therefore, the standard definition has become 40 hours a week. Uh, I would suggest that if we go back to that system of, of a work week, full-time work week being 40 hours, employers would not have as many of the administrative challenges and hindrances to growth that the 30-hour work okay. week provides. Thank you. Mr. Anastos, what happens to you if we do away with the 30-hour rule and, and you're able to, to, to bring your, your folks back up in their hours? Can you hit that microphone? 
quite simply, it greatly simplifies our, our life. I mean, when I talk about doubling or tripling the cost, I'm not even talking about the administrative costs. I talked to our CEO before I came down here and, and, what, and asked him what he think, thought, and he said anything. He said any relief at all to get close to 40 hours. Will workers' hours likely increase at your place? Absolutely. I mean, it's, in other words, instead of having to manage all the time and always keep this, this ledger where you're always trying to figure out are they over 30 hours and therefore, as an average, going to cost you many thousands of dollars more. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have the survivability of the business. I have to manage to that first. And it puts us in a situation where I'm managing against my employees' interests, yeah. which is against my interests. Mr. Troutline, retail, do you, does this help increase workers' hours if we do away with the 30-hour rule? Without a doubt. Uh, it makes it the compliance cost easier, makes it easier to manage the blend between full and part-time employees. Many part-time employees don't want to work full-time, and that's something that um, under the 30-hour rule, they have um, continued to work that part-time, but with fewer hours, less money in their pockets. So certainly from a retail and chain restaurant standpoint, this would improve things measurably. Mr. Snyder, do you think adjunct professors at community colleges uh, want to see this 30-hour rule changed? Uh, absolutely, because the uh, bulk of them are making decisions that are counter to their own best interests and certainly counter to ours. And I think the point that you made, and that is the 40-hour rule, if we move to that, would memorialize 40 hours as a benchmark that you should in good conscience as an employer be offering health care to everyone and trying to get more people into that 40 hours. Because I think the 30-hour actually puts 40-hour plans at risk because somebody has to pay for that cost. Yep. Good point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. McDermott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last week uh, <clears throat> I read a headline, uh, Did Obamacare Break Up the Captain and Tennille Marriage? Now, a reasonable reader could write that off as sensational journalism, but the way the right-wing media has played it, uh, the Affordable Care Act appears to be a very devious thing. Uh, I sure, I'm sure we'll hear shortly how Obamacare has uh, brought problems in the Middle East and created problems in the waters of West Virginia and probably even climate change. If we can get rid of this 30-hour rule, why, everything will be all better. We're talking about a preposterous accusation that the ACA has forced, and I emphasize forced, F-O-R-C-E-D, businesses to cut hours. Now, I have no doubt what think tanks can come up with statistics to make their claim and what our panel is doing without any real evidence. they got anecdotal stuff. I know more about the community colleges in the state of Washington than I think probably anybody, having been the chairman of the Ways and Meads Committee. They have used part-time employees and jerked their employees around for years to reduce their full-time equivalents. So it's not something new that's coming because of Obamacare. There are no penalties until 2016. So who exactly is forcing you to do this now? For those of you wondering what this phony hearing is really all about, you ought to look no further than tonight's State of the Union. This is put in the morning before the State of the Union to create a make-believe problem that the, pro the President has to deal with, right? Here's what this hearing really ought to be about. What is corporate responsibility? Now, Citizens United decided that corporations were individuals. So I guess they're individually responsible, right? But people like to talk about individual responsibility. In individuals ought to have their own health care. And there's three ways you get it. You either get it from you buy it yourself, or you get it through your employment, or the government provides it for you. And we took this Republican idea of letting industry and the insurance industry and the corporations would put this together, and now every time we turn around, there's another problem that's destroying the American economy because of the Affordable Care Act. They basically are saying they have no responsibility for their employees. Now, you have to ask yourself, with record profits, if you look at what's going on in the stock market right now, you have to say, 
don't they have a responsibility to insure their employees? I mean, is there no responsibility in this country? Are we supposed to, we're talking in this committee, we're going to lower taxes. The corporate tax rate is killing America. We've got to lower that corporate tax rate. And we're not going to require them to provide or offer insurance to their employees? Basically, what this committee is deciding, what the Congress decided with the Affordable Care Act was, that people had a responsibility to offer to their employees health insurance. Now, we can argue about the level for until the cows come home. Um, really, the question is, do you want a workforce that's healthy or not? Or do you just want them to work? See, we could go back to 1910 when there was no unemployment insurance and there was no industrial insurance, and we treated workers like, well, you get sick, you're prop get out of here. We'll hire another one off the street to replace you. And if that's the world we want to go back to, then you're going in the wrong direction for me because this bill is trying to figure out how do we use this system we've created. Now, Mr. Rangel has asked Mr. Chin, give me an example of something we can do to fix it, and we get nothing except repeal the bill. Well, we tried that 49 times, and it isn't going to happen. It this is, a, in my view, a question that this committee has got to deal with. Whose responsibility is it for the health of American people? And I like, uh, somebody said maybe this is the first hearing on single payer. It probably is. Because if you keep working to kill what you've created under Romney care, which Mr. Obama took and put in place for the whole country, you're going to get single-payer care because Americans are not going to walk away from people who don't have health care. All right. You and I pay 1000 bucks a month. Mr. T. Berry is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chin, in, in um, Central Ohio, this make-believe problem um, has caused the Ohio State University to lower the cap on student work hours to below 30 hours. They're not the only four-year college to have announced that. Students have been impacted. Columbus State Community College has reduced hours for adjunct professors, adjunct faculty, and hourly workers to less than 30 hours a week as a result of the Affordable Care Act. The Upper Arlington City School District has already cut hours for aides who work with disabled students from 32 and a half hours per week to 28 hours per week, citing the Affordable Care Act. In uh, my sister's city, where she lives with her two sons and her husband, Lebanon, Ohio, reduced the hours of 18 part-time paramedics and fighter fighters. Public Safety Director Mike Michael Blackwell said, and I quote, we were scheduling most of our part-time workers to about 39 hours a week. With Obamacare and the regulations that follow, we cut all those part-time employees down to less than 29 hours per week. And many towns who employ part-time paramedics and, and EMTs have done the same thing throughout the state where I live. How does a 30-hour a rule uh, that some call preposterous, others say is make-believe, impact a typical paramedic who now is working less than 30 hours a week? Uh, Congressman Tiberi, the typical uh, paramedic probably uh, makes about $11 an hour, and if the work is cut from 39 hours a week to 20 hour, 29 hours a week, that paramedic loses about 25 percent of his or her pay. In a similar fashion, if it's cut from 39, uh, excuse me, from 35 down to 29, they lose about 17 percent of their pay. So obviously there, there is a, a negative impact uh, with respect to those folks. I ran into a lady at the grocery store who was working part-time for a retail employer, and she was provided health care. She lost her health care this month, um, and her hours were reduced to less than 30 hours a week, and she was fine working part-time. Her husband's an independent contractor, did not get health care through his, his work. And so she took a pay cut. She lost her ability to purchase insurance. She took a second part-time job so her and her husband could afford to go onto the exchange and make up for 
about the fact that she lost insurance and, and lost hours. Is that something typical that you've heard among the three million people who now are getting health care in the exchange, who were forced off because they either uh, no longer qualify because of 30-hour work week or as a spouse, they lost their coverage through their, their, their working spouse? Uh, yes, sir. Those, those stories are, are quite common. Uh, and, and, and in fact, I think the incentives are aligned in such a way that uh, you may be hearing more of those kinds of stories. So I received an email from a constituent in New Albany. Her 25-year-old son-in-law was offered a full-time position with a retail company in Ohio. He accepted the job, eligible to receive health care benefits after six months on the job. And according to her, it was, quote, a godsend for him and her daughter, who had an 11-month-old baby at the time, and, her, and her, her daughter was pregnant with another on the way. After four months on the job, because of the ACA requirement, his employer cut his hours to less than 30 hours per week, no longer eligible for health care benefits. Uh, they were forced to give up their apartment, move in with family, and now can't locate full-time work with another employer due to this fear of the, the uh, regulation. Is that something you've heard as well? Yes, sir, it is. Um, Mr. Anastos, uh, pretty clear that the 30-hour rule is forcing employers to cut back on hours. You were beginning to talk about the food service industry. White Castle's headquartered in Columbus. They have already made this announcement in July that they were going to uh, hire all new people at less than 30 hours because of the mandate. Have you heard this happening across the fast food sector and retail sector? Can you turn on your microphone? In fact, that grocery store was the same story I heard last week where a woman was looking off, I mean, where she said the same thing and her hours were cut. But, you know, i just like to say that we're not all, you know, record profits and Wall Street companies. I mean, I started painting houses and working in a Wonder Bread factory as a union worker. And what I'm getting at is we don't have that. So we're going to double and triple our health cost. I mean, small business is like the golden goose of job creation. I mean, how much more can they put on us? And, um, but as far as managing to 30 hours, yes, those three new hotels, which we'll be building, and we're building them because we're building them essentially with other people's money, is that um, we will manage those to 30 hours because we have to find out how viable that business is. Thank All you. Right. I yield back. You. Mr. Neal is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Snyder, I'm a big supporter of community colleges. And I think for the purposes of clarification, just to raise a couple of questions with you. Uh, in the last 10 years, have you hired more adjunct faculty or have you hired more tenure track professors? Um, we've uh, tried to keep the, well, we've tried to actually increase our uh, percentage of full time professors, but the growth of the community college is not permitted. So I'd say uh, that we probably added about, uh, the ratio is about the same. We've gone from about 4,000 to 4,500 and from about 1,200 to 1500 1450 so we but it's generally a cost it's both a cost and availability issue fair enough but has the trend line over this decade been to hire more part-timers than more full-timers no i think our goal was to reduce our cost and actually hire more full-time okay. on a percentage basis and would it be conceivable that within the system that uh well let me ask you this what would a full-time faculty member carry for uh classroom hours uh, fifth, they're, they're in, in the community college, they teach. So they would teach five courses per semester, and uh, then they would sign an additional contract for the summer if they were going to teach in the summer. So, so 15 hours? Full load, right. Okay. Is it conceivable that within the system that you would have uh, two professors both teaching 15 hours where one might uh, be considered full-time and the other might be considered adjunct? It, it might be. Okay, that, that's kind of the point of this, and I understand arguing this flat around, but part of the problem here has clearly been that there has been a long-term trend toward hiring across the country, hiring more adjuncts. Now, some universities for cost purposes, I understand that, but I think it's kind of difficult sometimes to just discern the point that you raised earlier, that you might not hire based upon the following. Is that fairly accurate? Well, I think that you would want to look at the bigger picture, and that is, the full-time professor signs an annual contract, which right. requires office hours, which right. requires tenured, advising, uh, which requires course development. Right. A, a, full -time. a tenured faculty member would sign a year-to-year -year contract? Uh, ours are not tenured, but they've always signed a year-to-year -year contract. Yes. Okay, but generally, in it, but it'd be the life, same. It'd be the same in a tenured agreement. These would be the job requirements. Most and tenured professors would sign a year-to-year -year contract. Well, our professors all do. 
but I would suggest that that's probably not the case at most universities. Well, it's been that way for the school for decades. So, okay. but the, right. but the point being that that the adjunct, just to be clear, the adjunct is only obligated to show up for orientation to do the outside of coursework, right. but then to be in class. Uh, what would typically be 9 to 12 hours per week. And so what the regulations would require is that we somehow assess on a fair basis the prep time in a way that determines did they or did they not exceed 30 hours, okay. which is an unconscionable task at the moment. But, but in the state of New York today, it's very clear that in the state of New York that more and more full-time faculty members are augmented by those who carry the same number of hours in the state of New York who are adjuncts. And I think the trend line is pretty clear over the last 10 years that most universities have moved in the direction of more and more part-time lecturers who they've not had to pay full-time right. benefits. I, I would say this, having read the articles, and I don't have all the detail, I've read the articles, yeah, no. there's also the implication that there is a increase in professors who are non-tenured, not exactly adjuncts, which would be Pre different, which would be a different uh, pace. Okay, level. but fair enough, okay, fair enough. Right. But I just wanted to see if we could clear some of that up. Um, Dr. Levy, productivity. Uh, the whole notion of productivity and what's happened uh, over the last few years, even as the economy has been mired in this, this slump, productivity has actually gone up, hasn't it? It has, yes. Substantially? Um, yes, I would say so. So could you in link that notion of productivity gains perhaps to health care benefits and the security of one having health care? Well, there's very good evidence that having health insurance improves financial security and health outcomes for the people who have it. So it's certainly um, the case that some of the economic benefits that the coverage expansions of the Affordable Care Act would include improvements in health and productivity, yes. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think one of the arguments that would be worth having here at some point, or, or discussions I should say, would be having some folks come in to talk about the whole notion of productivity gains across the American economy during the last few years. They've been really substantial. The problem is, as we discussed this whole notion of income disparity, one of the interesting parts of it is while productivity has really been gained, real wages and salary haven't. And Dr. Levy, would you comment on that? Yes, that's right. I mean, so to the extent that we're concerned about inequality, as, as Dr. Chen highlighted in his testimony, of course we do always need to be worried about the well-being of low-income families, of um, in particular the workers who are less likely to have health insurance. Um, and I think that's exactly why the idea of changing the hours threshold is so problematic, because you put many more of those workers at risk of having their hours reduced by changing the threshold for full time. All right, Dr. Thank Chen. You. Oh. Thank you, I'm going to, yeah, thank you. I'm going to go two to one now, so uh, Mr. Reichert is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Chen, how does the 30-hour rule impact school bus drivers? Uh, Congressman, I think the reality is that many of these um, individuals are going to face the same kinds of difficulties as other uh, workers we've talked about. You might see, for example, that if they were to have their hours cut, from 39 hours down to 29 hours a week, that they would be looking at a pay cut of roughly 25% or more. Uh, if they're cut from 35 hours to 29 hours, you're looking at a pay cut of about 20%. So obviously the, the impact is significant, and school districts, the, the data is pretty clear with respect to school districts that they are feeling the pinch of the 30-hour rule uh, in fact, over 100 school districts have reported making changes to hours for people like school bus drivers, temporary and other workers, or just outsourcing that work entirely. Thank you. It, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, uh, Dr. Chin, of course, we know this is not a, a make-believe problem. Uh, it's, it's not a theoretical concern. It's not a political or ideological disagreement. This is really happening uh, to workers out there across the country. It's happening now. Uh, school bus drivers are having their hours cut because of Obamacare's 30-hour rule. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit this article for the record from the Huffington Post that reports how school districts have cut back hours for bus drivers because of this rule. Without objection, so ordered. I'd also like to enter into the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, a letter to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and the ranking member from the Employers for Flexibility and Healthcare Coalition. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Dr. Chen, um, I'd like to follow up on a line of questioning that uh, Mr. Johnson uh, began um, as to what happens when people lose hours and earnings as a result of the 30-hour uh, rule. 
We know that businesses are reducing employers' hours or reducing the size of their workforce in response to the 30-hour rule. So what happens to individuals' unemployment benefits if they're laid off? Don't uh, unemployment checks for the unemployed go down if people work and earn less while they're employed? Yes, sir, that would be an impact. Thanks, sir. How about the 401K contributions based on, on earnings? Won't those go down as well? Yes, sir, that would also be affected. So wouldn't that cause retirement income to decline and poverty to increase down the line? Uh, there's no question that retirement security would be one of the uh, side effects, or less retirement security would be a side effect, yes, sir. Or are there any other examples of unintended consequences for the safety net from this misguided 30-hour hour rule that you can, can think of? Um, you know, the, the biggest one simply is the loss of wages. The, the other thing I would say is that the sort of more global concern about cost increases created by the ACA uh, also makes it less likely that employers would offer health insurance to part-time workers. So we've seen recent examples of this, Target, Home Depot, uh, other companies, major companies have made the decision to migrate away from an offer of health insurance to part-time employees as well. And, and Dr. Chen, from the data in the back of your testimony, uh, we find that the persons who are most vulnerable to Obamacare's 30-hour rule are young females with a high school education or less. 59% of the vulnerable population are under uh, age 35. 63% are female. 53% have a high school diploma or less. Is that true? Yes, sir, that is true. These are the groups who are most likely to lose hours and earnings as a result of Obamacare's 30-hour rule. Do you think the administration intended for these groups to lose hours and earnings? Uh, I, I would hope not, sir. Won't many of them be single moms who are already struggling to raise children on a limited income? Uh, unfortunately, yes, that, that may be the case. And why do you think it makes sense to reduce, or does it make sense to reduce their hours and wages as, a th as the 30-hour rule will do? Well, I, you know, I think that the reality is that this is another example of not thinking through the incentives clearly. And obviously what's happening here is that many of these individuals are going to feel the impact of the 30-hour rule, although that may not have been intended at the time, but certainly will be the outcome. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Dr. Rustani is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Leonard Frank has, is a constituent of mine in Lafayette, Louisiana. And when he was in college some years ago, he started working at a pizza hut. And he started probably at minimum wage and worked and saved. And today, he's a proud owner of America's Pizza Company, which is headquartered in Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, they have 148 pizza hut locations in five states and 4,000 employees. A real entrepreneur, a great American story. And I spoke to Leonard, and he told me because of this 30-hour rule, every employee every employee in his organization will be moving to a, to a less than 30-hour work week. The company, uh, he made a, an economic decision. The company is going to be penalized 3 to $4 million per year under ACA if he didn't make this decision. Furthermore, this, this decision will primarily affect college kids, first-time employees, and single working mothers. And in his business, he starts them off above minimum wage. He pays market rates. This provision is now forcing employees to leave the company to seek out minimum wage jobs to make up lost hours. Dr. Chen, is this the new normal for America's working families? We, we've certainly seen some uh, troubling trends over these last several years, Congressman. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, 7.8 million Americans currently are in part-time work but desire full-time work. They're unable to find it due to uh, a variety of different economic reasons. Uh, and, and beyond that, uh, certainly a number of individuals will face, uh, as we argue, almost 3 million individuals will face potentially their hours being cut because of the dynamics created by the 30-hour rule. Mr. Troutwine, is, uh, you, know, you rec represent the retailers. Is this the new normal? I fear it could be. Uh, there is a one-year delay in the employer mandate penalties, so I think that has softened the glide path. Uh, there is also a prohibition in the ACA against making 
uh, insurance-based employment uh, decisions, that may be deferring, deferring that. But uh, if I were out there running a store, I'd have to think twice about the next hire I make and where I place that individual in my company. So it's certainly um, not good. Now, from a standpoint of a part-time employee, some want to work more. They want to work their way into full-time, and retail and chain restaurants have rewarded the best performing employees that way. Others wrap their work around school, around other obligations, and they want to stay part-time. So again, it's a question of how many dollars are in their pockets? Are they working under 30 hours or up towards 40 hours? And certainly from that standpoint, they're better off at that higher uh, rate of compensation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a letter from the NFIB that was addressed to you and to Ranking Member Levin, and I would like for it to be made part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Anastos, it's been almost four years since the law passed, and the employer mandate has been put on hold. It would have gone into effect this month. Um, what do you – I mean, you're still having to prepare for this because there's a temporary reprieve in this. Do you have the information you need to make decisions? It's funny you should ask. I mean, not funny you should ask, but it's so – I ask – I've met with more people, the head of insurance commission in Maine, every insurance person I can think of, and the problem is it's it's hard, it's almost like that old saying, nail and jello to a wall, to figure out really how much it's going to hurt us or, or not hurt us. And it's, uh, so do I feel I have all the information? I, I, I have all I can possibly get, but then, of course, the law changes all the time. I mean, so I, it's, it's just so hard to, I, I don't know. And that's so you're faced with tremendous uncertainty as you try to plan how to grow your business and create jobs. That's the understatement of the year, really, truly, truly. Thank you. I yield back. All right. Mr. Doggett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to our, our witnesses. There are those who believe that uh, we are better off in America if many of the people who serve our meals, uh, make up the bed at our hotel room, or educate our youth cannot access health insurance. Uh, I don't share that view. I'd rather like the people who are serving my meal to have gone to the doctor if they have the flu or maybe gotten a flu shot and have access to health care. Uh, I think the underlying reasoning of those who would repeal the Affordable Health Care Act is not unlike those who say they are helping minimum wage workers by keeping the minimum wage at a minimum and not raising it to a livable wage as the President uh, is seeking to do through an executive order for those who are federal contractors in which the Congress should extend uh, to all minimum wage workers. It is true that the Affordable Care Act has been blamed for just about everything but the polar vortex. Uh, and, uh, and I read this, hear this story about bus drivers in Indiana. I mean, that was something that was reported last June about uh, an event that won't even occur in to, to, until 2016. You have to wonder whether it really had anything to do with the Affordable Care Act. We had a little of that with at least one community college system in Texas blaming the Affordable Care Act for uh, what it would do with adjunct faculty. And they ended up having to retreat from that position because, in fact, in Texas since 2003, adjunct faculty at our community colleges have been eligible for health coverage of the same type that is offered to full-time faculty and employees. Indeed, uh, three years after the Affordable Care Act last year, Governor Rick Perry signed a law that made even more adjunct faculty uh, eligible for that health coverage. You have to think that if a state can't meet the low level Governor Perry sets, that it really has problems much bigger than adjunct faculty. Uh, at uh, Austin Community College, at the Alamo Colleges, uh, we have uh, many adjunct faculty members uh, that are working fewer hours than 30. They're eligible to get coverage the question is, who pays for it? Uh, and uh, at the uh, adjunct faculty level, if you have a lawyer uh, who is part-time teaching business law, they probably have coverage through their employer already. Uh, unless uh, the insurance is unaffordable, it exceeds 10%, 9.5%, I guess, of their income, 
uh, there is not an obligation to provide coverage. There are many reasons why community colleges use adjunct faculty. Some of them are uh, citizens in the community who are doing very well and enjoy teaching on a part-time basis. There are many others in some communities as the Democratic staff of the uh, Education and Workforce Committee reported in January, who are treated very poorly and paid very poorly and very much need the very kind of health insurance coverage that the Affordable Care Act offers. There are also many people in the private sector who are benefiting from the Affordable Health Care Act. I think of Gabe Farias, who's the Executive Director of the West Chamber of Commerce in San Antonio, Texas, a group of small businesses that are really encouraging job growth in that community. Mr. Farias was telling me that both he and his wife were able to get significantly better coverage at less because of the exchanges in the Affordable Health Care Act. I think of Ron Romero, who is in the technology industry, who talked about the advantages of avoiding job lock that were offered by the Affordable Care Act that encourage the expansion and innovation in small business. And it's to be remembered that this 30-hour rule did not come to us like manna from heaven. Like most of the problems with the Affordable Care Act, and there are many, it was the result of compromise in the legislative process. There were some who said, well, you know, we really should not ask employers to cover half-time workers. Let's go with 30 hours as a reasonable compromise. If we'd gone with 25, we'd be here today hearing about the 24-hour rule. If we'd gone with 35, we'd be here today hearing about the 34-hour rule. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Levy, you pointed out that if we'd used the 40-hour standard, uh, w what would we have about three times as many people affected? Yes, that's right. Three to five times as many workers potentially at risk of having their hours cut. So I think what we achieved is a reasonable balance. We need to be working to see that all Americans uh, have access to a family doctor, to affordable health care. Uh, that's the direction in which we have moved. We have done so imperfectly. We've done so with a considerable amount of bungling in the rollout of the Affordable Health Care Act. But its objectives are genuine and the potential is great. We need to be working to achieve it instead of undermining it. I yield back. Thanks, gentlemen. Mr. Smith, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panels, all of you, for sharing your insight and perspective. I think it's, it's very valuable and important. And I was looking at a, at a report uh, of various uh, entry-level jobs, and uh, it was intriguing to know the average wage of, of many of these jobs. For example, uh, dishwashers uh, earn eight eighty-two an hour, just under $9 an hour. I don't think anyone, anyone would say that uh, that provides a great deal of, of financial comfort. But if, if they go from 39 hours a week earning $344 uh, to uh, 29 hours a week, and they would lose about $53 per week or the equivalent of a 17% pay cut. And it, it's very compelling uh, looking at all of this information. And certainly as I uh, um, hear from folks, you know, across rural Nebraska in this case, uh, you know, there, there are realities out there that are, are very difficult uh, for employees, employers, virtually everyone uh, to, to uh, contend with. And so uh, I would ask uh, Dr. Levy, can you point to perhaps some, some components uh, of the health care law that reflect the differences between, between rural and urban areas of the country? Um. I'm not sure exactly when you're saying urban and rural in terms of the labor markets, do you mean? Well, as, as it relates to this issue, uh, you know, we know that unemployment rates vary drastically from one state to another, not to mention regions of one, of one state to another. Okay, sure. Um, I guess I tend to think of the impacts of the law being more related to where people are in the income distribution rather than their geographic location. So um, the affordability issue, as you know, is much more of a problem for lower income families. And right, so and on, on the affordability topic, would, have you studied how the uh, affordability uh, of health insurance would impact the frequency of its purchase? Oh, um, yes, we do know that people are more likely to buy things that when the price is lower, yes. And, but in, in terms of its practical application, has that been a, a part of recent uh, reviews or, or studies? Um, I mean, we 
we expect that the combination of the individual mandate in the Affordable Care Act combined with the subsidies through the premium tax credits will have a large effect on the take-up of health insurance, yes. So we would expect many more people to get insurance, both through the exchanges ultimately and through the Medicaid expansion, and we expect that to improve. The evidence we have suggests that that will have positive effects on health and financial security. So that the overall plan of the Affordable Care Act in making health insurance more affordable to people provides better economic security. Okay. Now, you indicated in your testimony that because of, of the uh, ACA, such workers will be able to choose the schedules they prefer. Um, now, right prior to that, in context, uh, you, you highlighted, you know, how people are in different situations. Um, are there some specific examples of, of people really being able to ch have more flexibility or more choice of the hours uh, in, in the last few months? Um, I, I haven't heard I, any individual examples of someone saying, you know, thank goodness I can now go to part-time or now I can start my own business, but I do expect that over time we will be hearing those stories. Okay, because for a long time, I mean, some folks have, depending on their, their personal situation, have preferred to work part-time. Would you agree with that? The majority of part-time employment is what's called voluntary part-time employment, yes. People who work part-time because they're also taking care of family members or going to school or something like that. So, um, as Dr. Chen has said, 7.8 uh, million workers are currently in voluntary part-time, what we call part-time for economic reasons. But that's um, higher than usual at the moment because we're recovering from a recession still, and even now it's less than half of the part-time workforce. So the majority of part-time workers are, are they, they want to work part-time. Okay. And Dr. Chen, have, have you ever affixed a, uh, a dollar figure perhaps, uh, an hourly dollar figure on the value of, of health insurance? I, I don't have a single figure, uh, Congressman. What I would say is that... Um, Certainly it is the case that under the ACA, for employees who are working in that 30 to 36 hour slot, it is more expensive for the employer to provide that employee with health insurance than someone working closer to 40 hours, let's say, because of the 9.5% affordability requirement contained in the ACA. So I'm not sure if that gets at the exact question you're asking, but I think the point is simply that it is more expensive for the employer to furnish to someone working 30 to 36 hours versus someone working 40 or more hours. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Paulson's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, this testimony really strikes home with me. It's very, sim very similar to what I'm hearing from a lot of folks in Minnesota, employers, uh, particularly in the restaurant industry and retail uh, industry in particular, and also fire departments. I mean, there were, there's no doubt that I've heard from several fire chiefs that have told me the bottom line is that if the language has not changed, the law has not changed in the Affordable Care Act, uh, a lot of city fire departments are going to have to either lay off or reduce hours for volunteer fire departments, volunteer firefighters, uh, or they're going to have to drastically increase taxes to expand the budgets for these fire departments. And companies are no doubt having to scale back hours with more part-time jobs and less full-time jobs. So there's a direct consequence uh, that employees that have had good full-time jobs now have part-time jobs. Um, I know there's one restaurateur that I spoke with in Minnesota. Uh, he owns seven restaurants. He's got 535 employees. And many in this industry, you think they only employ part-time folks, right? He actually has 41% of his workers working full-time. But now, because of the new law, he's being forced to move all of those folks, nearly all of them, into part-time status of 29 hours. Uh, and that's, that's just wrong. That's the consequence again. Um, Mr. Chen, let me just ask a question on retail sales workers, though. Um, how does the 30-hour rule impact retail sales workers? The research that we've done suggests that they are uh, clearly at risk because of the 30-hour rule. Uh, and in fact, if I recall correctly, I think they are most at risk uh, because of the nature of their work schedules and uh, the way in which uh, the 30-hour rule sets up the incentives for them potentially to have their hours cut. So I, I, I would say that the retail industry is that uh, workers in the retail industry are at significant risk. 
And Mr. Troutwine, this just follows up with your area of expertise. I mean, what is, it, what is different about the retail business that makes the 30-hour rule such a top priority for your industry as opposed to, say, an insurance company or a Wall Street firm, big Wall Street firm? It's really the nature of the retail industry. Uh, frequently, we're open seven days a week, not quite 24 hours a day, but occasionally that too. But because of the close margins the retail industry has, um, certainly if we increase the cost of labor, we can afford to, to have fewer employees in, and it's uh, less expensive to have part-time employees than have full-time employees. But from our standpoint, you know, this is not something that we're either for or against uh, insurance coverage. Retailers were one of the first industries to come up with health insurance coverage. So it's a question of, of how much additional cost for providing coverage, how much additional compliance cost, how do you keep people in that sweet spot there, and what the effect that has on how people operate uh, their businesses. There are very, very expensive ways to manage, technological ways to manage workforce within that look back period. But I worry a lot about the small independent uh, stores who maybe are up above that 50 employee applicable level. It's a lot harder for them to manage that cost. So a lot of what we, what we retailers and chain restaurants worry about is the compliance cost of managing this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Kind is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, want to thank our witnesses for your testimony here today. Um, you know, when I had supported the Affordable Care Act a few years ago, I was one who did not believe it was a perfect bill, that it was going to be a bill that would be required constant updating and changes in reform as we learn what's working and what isn't. So, you know, getting feedback is going to be important as we move forward so that we try to obtain the goal of more affordable more quality health care coverage for all Americans. And hopefully it's a goal that's shared, but the constant drumbeat of criticism about what is taking place I don't think is very helpful or constructive in trying to come up with some workable solutions. Recently, I think there's been some misconceptions about Target's recent announcement uh, that, they, uh, that they released. While earlier this week Target on a blog clarified a few of the points that have been, I think, misinterpreted. First of all, they made clear that they're not reducing hours for their workers. They do not support raising the 30-hour rule to a 40-hour uh, uh, full-time uh, rule. And they also feel that less than 10% of the workers that are now going into the exchange are better served in the exchange because there's more affordable coverage in it. And so, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, with unanimous consent, I'd like to introduce the target blog for the record for the sake of clarification at this time. Without objection, so ordered. Dr. Levy, let me ask you just a couple of questions with my time remaining. Anecdotally, I've been struck by the number of people in Wisconsin that have come up to me talking about the job lock issue, that now for the first time they're able to branch off and start a business that they were reluctant to before for fear of them or a family member with a pre-existing condition and them losing health care coverage. What are you seeing in the labor market in regards to job lock and whether or not this might spur some more entrepreneurs that have the ability now to finally strike out on their own if they do have a good idea or if they've wanted to start a business uh, for some time? So there's good research that supports the idea that currently people are inhibited from starting businesses by the fact that employment and health insurance are so closely tied to each other. So the best research we have looks at, um, for example, people who already have employer-sponsored health insurance coverage through their spouse. Those people are significantly more likely to go start a business than people who do not have that option of coverage. Also, you can see at age 65, for men who are working full time, there's a jump up in the probability of starting a business at age 65 when men become eligible for Medicare that is presumably related to the fact that now they no longer have to keep working for the health insurance. So all of the evidence from what we've seen so far suggests that the, uh, the, de that the fact that the Affordable Care Act provides an alternative to employer-sponsored coverage um, should increase mobility across types of employment and increase the rate at which people start businesses. Now, I've got a lot of small business uh, owners, obviously, in western Wisconsin. Uh, many of them have been able to take advantage of the tax credit. When the ACA was first passed, the data and the information we had showed that with employers of 50 or more workers, roughly 95% of them were already providing health care coverage. 
Of course, those small businesses up to 50 workers weren't required under the law to provide health care coverage, but there were incentives to help small business owners be in a better position to extend coverage for their workers even. What are you seeing in, in, with small business uh, owners, small businesses generally in the labor market, their ability to start providing uh, health care coverage for their workers? Yeah, so, so as you say, the administration, the, the Affordable Care Act did in, has included and still includes uh, um, premium tax credit to help offset the costs for small businesses that are providing health insurance. Um, it's also true that the tax code, it, it's built into the tax code that there's a, a assistance for employers providing insurance because health insurance isn't taxed as income to the worker. So there's a significant um, advantage to employers who provide health insurance compared to providing that compensation in the form of wages. That's one of the important, that's one important reason why so many small firms, in addition to almost every large firm, provide, already provide health insurance for their workers, even in the absence of any kind of requirement to do so. And we're hoping with the creation of small business health insurance marketplace, too, that there'll be a better choice for them with affordable <laughs> rates that they'll be able to extend to their employees. Oftentimes, this, this conversation is focused on some of the anomalies that's working its way through the system and that. And, you know, about 30-hour week or 40-hour week and not enough focus about, all right, if it's not working, then what's the alternative of making sure that those workers have access to affordable health care coverage? We just saw one announced on the Senate side by some Republican senators, and it's one big cost shift proposal is what they're offering in their plan. And it's taking away the tax exclusion within the code, making it harder then for businesses to be able to offer health care coverage, and it's shifting. And this has been a trend, I think, with a lot of large businesses where getting away from defined benefit plans to a now defined contribution, pensions are going away. And the concern I think a lot of workers are feeling is that employer-based health care coverage, too, is going to either continue to be shifted on their backs through higher deductibles and co-pays, or they'll just go away uh, entirely. What trends are you seeing in that regard, Dr. Levy? Well, there's very little evidence that there will be um, sort of large-scale dropping of employer-sponsored coverage by large firms. They've almost all always offered it, even in the absence of a requirement to do so. The business case for doing so remains strong, and in fact, it's even stronger as a result of the individual mandate, because now even more workers, and we, we've heard that from Mr. Anastas, even more workers want to get health insurance. So, for, so large firms have very strong incentives, as they always have, to continue to offer employer health insurance. All right, thank you. Thank Mr. You. Marchand is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, received a letter recently from uh, Tom Hardiman, who runs a McDonald's, has a franchise in my district. The Affordable Health Care Act must be repealed. The financial impact of this law on my business will be devastating if not changed. I don't think I need to go into details, but there are businesses across the country that will go broke because of this unreasonable law. I will repeat what I said to you in the office. I used to think of Burger King, Wendy's, and Sonic as my competition and the greatest risk to my business, but now I believe it is our government. As I look into the future and assess risk, it's regulation, taxation, mandated programs, and interference from the government that has the potential to destroy my business and small businesses like mine across this great land. This is just an example of the many letters that I receive in my office every day. Uh, and many of the comments are about the uh, lack of flexibility the ACA gives in part-time employees. Uh, Mr. Chan, Dr. Chen, not only is health care a major consideration for companies when they consider moving someone from part-time to full-time, but there are pension obligations that go along with it. Is it fair to say that if you were to move somebody from, say, 36, 39 hours to a 40-hour full-time position, that it could add 30, 35 percent cost to employ that person readily? Uh, certainly, the, the addition of the Additional hours plus the additional benefits could, could add up, yes, sir. So that same, same company now is having to make a decision to keep that person on to bring them back to 29 hours. Now, uh, some of the unintended consequences of that, I believe, uh, not, not in, the, in the higher paid staff, but in the restaurant business, yes. the hospitality business, is that many of those uh, employees are near 
uh, minimum wage or just above minimum wage. And if you take them from, say, 39 hours a week, uh, they, they uh, are above some of the thresholds that are very important in the uh, public uh, assistance world. If you take them from 29 hours, uh, from 39 hours to 29 hours, in many instances, uh, they will then begin to qualify for Medicaid. They will then begin to qualify for food stamps. Uh, they will then begin uh, to qualify for almost a 100% uh, supplement to their, to their Affordable Health Care Act. So uh, they will pay much less into the Social Security uh, Old Age Fund. They will pay, pay much less into the Social Security Disability Fund. And it will trigger all kinds of other public assistance. So really, does this law enable people to burst, to, to get out of poverty and to begin to work uh, in the workplace and get themselves off of all of these assistance programs? Or does this, does this law really push those same people back into a dependence mode? And uh, we already have a situation where major corporations in America are being accused of bringing their employees in and coaching them on how many hours they should take and how few hours they should work at the amount because, uh, it, and then they begin to show them if they will work a certain number of hours, then they can trigger the food stamp threshold. They can trigger uh, the uh, Social Security threshold. They can trigger the Affordable Health Care Act threshold. And uh, to me, if you look at this in a long-term perspective, the Affordable Health Care Act is not going to, and the net effect of it is not going to be that more of these people are going to have health insurance and more of these people are going to be more productive. It's going to, it's going to create a new normal where people will not work as much because their access to benefits will be so much greater because they are working less. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you to the panel. Um, I'm going to echo some comments from Mr. Marchin, and those comments are to read to you a real letter from a real person from Western New York that's dealing with this situation. Um, last week, I received from Victor Tirana in Jamestown, New York, small town in my uh, in my district, who is the owner of a local coffee shop at Tim Hortons, sharing his frustrations with me as a small business owner who is trying to keep his restaurant afloat while doing the best thing for his employees while complying with the maze of regulations coming out of Washington. He writes, Dear Congressman Reed, as a hardworking restaurateur, I am writing to urge you to work in a bipartisan way to address the challenges me and restaurant operators like me with the Affordable Care Act, the definitions of full-time employee, applicable large employer, and the automatic enrollment provision. The health care law has a particularly profound impact on the restaurant and food service industry. Our businesses are labor intensive with low profit margins with a workforce that is young and mobile while employing a significant number of part-time and seasonal employees. Due to these characteristics, the law is more difficult for restaurants to comply with than many other employers. It is critically important that the law's definition of full-time employee be rewritten so that it is more in line with the current employment practices and reflects my workforce's needs and my employees' desires for flexible hours. If not addressed by Congress soon, disruptions to the workforce could and will occur and flexible work options for employees will begin to disappear in my operation. The definition of large employer under the law is based on a complex 12-month calculation to determine whether an employer has 50 or more full-time equivalents, a calculation unique to this law and not easily implemented in large shift work environments. The annual calculation is unnecessarily complicated and sweeps millions of small businesses into its reach. Those on the cusp of the threshold must closely track their status, which increases small businesses' compliance burden. Congress should act to simplify the determination who is a small or large business under the law. Thank you for considering these, these um, issues. That's a real person. That's not some made-up issue. That's not some made-up uh, fact or anecdotal case. That's a real person that is dealing with this law today. And that resonates with me. And it's not just the definition of, of, of full-time employee. 
It's the compliance cost. As a small t business creator myself, prior to when I came to Congress, to comply with these mandates, to comply with these regulations takes real time. It takes real money. It takes a lot of stress as an owner of a small business. This gentleman employs 120 of my friends, neighbors, family members, and he is reaching out to me and telling me, you have to do something. So I get a little frustrated when I hear colleagues on the other side of the aisle say this is not really an issue, it's not something that needs to be dealt with, that we're, we're trying to blame everything under the sun on the Affordable Care Act. That's not the case. I care about these people. This isn't fair. These are real people that are business owners that have gone out there, risked their livelihoods, are employing real people, and those people that are employed, just do a calculation. In New York, it, it, we have an $8, $8 an hour minimum wage. So let's, he, let's assume he takes his employees and goes from 40 hours a week down to 30 hours a week. Just to, to, to comply with this uh, situation he's dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. That's $80 less each week they're taking home and about $350 each month. I don't know about you, but there are a lot of people in my district that are struggling. And when they get impacted by losing $350 a month because of some policy out of Washington, D.C., well, that's frustrating. So I, I, I guess I, I, will, I will turn to you, Mr. Trywine. You represent a lot of people in the retail industry. Is what Victor, what, what Victor is explaining to me and reaching out to me for help, is it real or am I, am I, is he just making this up? Unfortunately, Congressman, it is very, very real. And the concerns, I spent a lot of time trying to help my members understand what the various requirements of the Affordable Care Act, when they need to start worrying about them. You know, this issue of counting a variable hour employees in January, I'm sure there are still companies who are not aware of that and then will be foreclosed from having as much as a one-year look back. But a lot, to your point, their stock in trade is not health care. You know, they want to run their business, they want to run their restaurant, and their compliance burden with this is tremendous. So figuring out if they're lucky, they've got a licensed insurance agent who can kind of lead them through this, but the complexity of the different requirements are continuing to pile up and they are not ha happy with that compliance burden. Thank you. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Davis is recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Levy, as I've listened to the discussion this morning, I'm reminded of myself that I have attended in the last two months at least five openings of new facilities, new opportunities, community health clinics, uh, school clinics for teens. And I believe that in each one of these instances, new individuals are also being hired to take care of the additional workload that is developing. My county government has actually signed up more than 100,000 potential clients that they're going to be serving ultimately through their county care program due to a Medicaid waiver that they were able to acquire. Does the impact of these new services, new individuals, new clients, individuals who in some instances are in great need of health care to prevent debilitating um, experiences that they will have later on that will take them out of the workforce, that will prevent them from working at all. What impact does this have on job creation and, and our economy as a whole? I, I think that's a great point. Um, the best evidence we have on the overall impact of what the Affordable Care Act requires of employers comes from Massachusetts and Hawaii. And I do not mean to dismiss either the economic or the emotional resonance of the stories from individuals that we are hearing. 
But at the same time, I think it is important to look at the big picture, to take into account the fact that there are both other investments in hiring people occurring as a result of the Affordable Care Act, and also the fact that the economy is a powerful engine of growth, even as we are recovering from a recession, even in the face of these new requirements that we are hearing from my fellow panelists um, are pre presenting a challenge for them. As I said, the best evidence we have of what the overall picture is, adding up all of the stories that people tell and counting them as data, comes from Massachusetts and Hawaii, where we see no aggregate effect on employment, no negative effect on employment, and in Massachusetts, no shift toward part-time work as a result of the employer health insurance mandate. So I think the big picture, while it will always be possible in an economy with 150 million civilian workers, it will always be possible to find heartrending stories of bad things that are happening to people that their employers may be attributing to the Affordable Care Act. The aggregate evidence we have is that the Affordable Care Act will not harm the labor market. I've also listened intently to the gloom and doom that is being projected and some of which is being experienced as corporations and businesses and everybody kind of figure out how do they best navigate the, the compliance. It seems to me that talking about reducing hours that people work so that they cannot experience a quality of life that simply becomes desirable to me is not something that we should be encouraging businesses to do in in our country i mean how would you 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 respond to that notion i think that's right and you you don't want to do anything that creates an incentive um that affects you, you want to minimize any kind of distortion that m might be associated with these kind of regulations. That's why you want to have as few workers as possible at risk of having their employers cut their hours, and that's one reason why it's very important to keep the threshold at 30 hours instead of 40, because you have many more workers who are at risk if you move the threshold to 40 hours. Thank you very much. Uh, no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask permission, firstly, to submit to the record a statement by NFIB about the impact the 30-hour rule is having on small business uh, and uh, in support of H.R. 2575 to restore the traditional definition of full-time within the ACA. Without objection, so ordered. You know, just last week I visited with the superintendent of a school in southern Indiana in my district, uh, in Salem, Indiana, and she was distraught, joined by other members of her school board, uh, she was distraught that this new requirement, not only leading to administrative costs, which are burdening the school whose budget is already constrained, uh, she's concerned about the future, the future of uh, her substitute teachers and the ability to manage personnel. Uh, she's concerned about the ability to schedule said teachers in the classrooms at the right time. Uh, she speculated that uh, she may have to ask those teachers to come in late while students are in empty classrooms uh, so that they can keep those teachers below the 30-hour threshold. And very recently, one of her best employees actually left, citing this specific provision of the Affordable Care Act. 39 Indiana school corporations have sued the federal government in reference to this 30-hour provision because the undue financial and administrative burdens it puts on them. I've talked to representatives from Indiana University who said they'll cut the hours of 1,000 employees over the coming year to comply with this act and this provision. And of course, we've heard the compelling testimony today from the largest community college system in the country, a community college system known as Ivy Tech out of Indiana. Mr. Schneider, as president of Ivy Tech, uh, we've already heard from you today the impact of this 30-hour provision. Uh, it seems clear, at least from your perspective, that um, uh, this impact has not been exaggerated, it's not speculative, it's very real, and it's impacting your operations here and now. Uh, has the delay of the employer mandate for one year, and to any significant degree, made it easier to deal with this 30-hour provision? 
Well, there's a uh, pr proposal. The part of the law is the look back provision. So you actually have to keep the data now. We started keeping it at October 1st. So the administrative burden on this um, is taking place as we speak. What about um, the changes that were discussed here today? There were some discussed uh, to solve or, or at least salve uh, any problems uh, that uh, are related to the 30 hour provision. Do you think that those, uh, those proposals that were put forward, have you heard anything here today that would, that would entirely solve the challenges you're dealing with? No, I, I think your, your proposal is probably directionally the way we have to go. The, the current law is both prescriptive, very prescriptive, and vague at the same time, so that people in our situation don't really have a uh, compliance, full compliance understanding. And then I think the other thing which was brought up uh, by your colleagues, that the 40-hour the uh, benefit of health care is something that has, uh, uh, you know, throughout the land. And I think that employers, and having spent, you know, decades in the auto industry where competitive pressures are enormous, employers are going to great lengths to preserve 40-hour health care for everybody and trying to minimize the reduction in the benefit. And I think this actually is uh, counterintuitive in that is making the 30-hour week the threshold is going to force everybody in that same bucket and the additional cost for us, which is $12 million on a $25 million current spend, are uh, unachievable. Thank you. Um, Mr. Troutwine, uh, you're here obviously representing the retail industry today. Maybe you could speak to the retail industry and, and whether the employer mandate has helped uh, in a measurable, significant way addressing with the challenges uh, created by this 30-hour provision? I think it is a huge, huge challenge, Congressman, and we congratulate you on, on your legislation. We support it. With the additional, the, er, the tight margins that I mentioned earlier in the retail industry, it's very hard for us to take on additional labor costs. And this question of managing people to a new threshold is something that is, is very uncomfortable for our stores and restaurants. So from our standpoint, it's a big problem. Thank you. I, you know, I hope we can move forward. We can address this in a bipartisan way. I'm proud of uh, the bill that you referenced uh, that uh, I've introduced uh, with uh, Representative Kelly, Representative Olson, and Representative Wahlberg. Uh, gets bipartisan support moving forward. And uh, we need to restore this traditional definition of full-time under the Affordable Care Act. And I yield back. All right, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I want to start out by asking you, Dr. Chen, uh, where did the 30-hour number come from? Uh, Congressman, I, I, I believe there are different explanations. Some are that it was a product of legislative compromise. Uh, some might say it was pulled out of a hat. Uh, but it certainly doesn't seem to make much sense to me from where I sit, sir. Yeah. Well, uh, in Arkansas, we try to apply a little common sense, and uh, I don't know anywhere where 30 hours is full time. Uh, if you just want to have some kind of requirement, that's one thing, but to call 30 hours full time, I mean, France, it's not even full time. In France, it's 35 hours, and it's moving toward a 40. Uh, so that's uh, on its face laughable. Uh, when I look at the folks who have been impacted, let me tell you the sad part, and this often happens here. Good intentions by people on both sides of the aisle make their way into legislation which fails. Let me give you an example. So uh, in Arkansas, Arkansas State University, the alma mater of our uh, Democrat governor, uh, they had to cut folks back to a maximum of 28 hours per week. Now, I assume that those are people that the law or people that, that wrote this law wanted to make sure had insurance. So we want to give them insurance. That's the goal. What did they get? No insurance and less pay. Genius. That's a genius federal program right there. Now let me read you another one. Area, Area Agency on Aging of Western Arkansas. They did the same thing, went down to 28 hours per week. These people already had insurance because prior to the passage of Obamacare, they had been taking part in a program offered with the state of Arkansas called Arkansas Health Networks. So these people now lose their health insurance 
and get paid less. Just a great deal for them, right? Asian American hotel owners and operators have complained to me about this. Numerous stories from back home. Pulaski Technical College, um, and the list goes on and on and on. I don't doubt the intention, the well-intentioned actions of a lot of people, but Washington often gets it wrong. I heard a lot about Hawaii. Uh, I haven't been to Hawaii, uh, but I've seen pictures. I don't think Hawaii's economy looks anything like Arkansas. I'd, I'd probably dig a little deeper on that. Um, and, uh, you know, when I look at who this hurts, they're the people that folks up here in Washington talk about wanting to help. The vulnerable. I made a list of the people that you talked about, and you're a sharp guy, Stanford and all that. And uh, I look at all these stats here, numbers, I, I believe what you're telling me. You talked about lower-income folks, vulnerable folks, seniors, jobs generally, hurts jobs. You talked about school districts. You talked about colleges, small businesses. If I was to adopt the Democrat language, I would probably say that the 30-hour rule is a weapon in the war on women, the war on lower-income folks, the war on the vulnerable, the war on seniors, the war on job creation, the war on school districts, the war on colleges and small businesses. Sounds ludicrous, doesn't it? Well, that's the type of language that's used here. And let me tell you, the people that say they want to help those folks, they're hurting them. I have pages and pages and pages of letters People talking about the impact of this. I don't buy your numbers, Dr. Levy. I, I'd like to take a closer look. Maybe we can sit down. But, but I hear so many voices from back home, and it's no consolation to them that the jobs that they're losing in the private sector are being replaced by the, the county whatever expanding government jobs, which are, aren't sustainable and with borrowed money anyway. I mean, this is ridiculous. That's why I'm proud to support my colleague here, his bill. And um, I think ultimately we'll get there. I mean, the president's basically recognized a lot of these problems. The, the number one person in terms of repealing Obamacare has been President Obama. He does it unilaterally all the time. He doesn't like it, like it when we do it. Maybe we can convince him to take a look at this. Thank you all. All right, Mr. Mr. Pascrell is recognized for five minutes. Well, Mr. Chairman, after uh, the last dissertation, I would hope there would be growing support now uh, to vote the unemployment insurance back for those 1,400,000 people who lost their long-term uninsurance. Since you want to help those very people that you're talking about, yeah, don't hold your breath. Before I begin, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to address one issue raised earlier in this hearing, if I may. Uh, everyone here knows uh, I support the ACA and the intentions behind the employer mandate. I wrote the IRS a letter raising concerns about the impact of this provision on volunteer emergency personnel. Volunteer emergency personnel. The Obama administration has since indicated that they are addressing concerns that I and others have outlined. I would like to enter into the record, with your permission, the response I received from the IRS on this issue, since many uh, of our members have discussed this with me, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, no one can deny that uh, the facts are the facts, that health care spending growth has slowed to the lowest levels in 50 years. Medicare per capita cost growth is historically low. The fact is that in addition to providing $32 million Americans with health insurance, many for the first time, and giving parents peace of mind knowing that they can take their sick child to the doctor without being suffocated by medical bills they can't afford. The ACA is an investment in our citizens and in our economy. Dr. Levy, the expansion of Medicaid which is a major part of the ACA. Uh, some of the governors have bought in, some of the governors have said no, and some of the governors have been obstructionists. 
that expansion is, an, expansion is an important component of the Federal Care, Federal Care Act, the Affordable Care Act, and I think it will help millions of Americans gain coverage. That's already been seen. Uh, however, expanding Medicaid programs also provides important economic benefits for states. And the federal government will pick up virtually all the costs of the expansion. According to Families USA, my home state of New Jersey, the expansion of the Medicaid program will ensure nearly 400,000 residents. 400,000. That will result in more than $1 billion in new federal funding and support 14,500 jobs by 2016. Unfortunately, not expanding the Medicare programs is just one way some of the governors are priding themselves on being impediments. God knows we've seen enough here uh, of the ACA's success. My home state of New Jersey, thankfully, the governor got something right. The governor decided to expand our Medicaid program. However, he continues to sit on more than $7 million in federal funding to help educate our residents about the ACA. If he doesn't spend it, we should get it back. I'm fighting for this in every state and let private organizations educate the public. Dr. Levy, can you discuss some potential positive economic effort effects just on that portion of the ACA Medicaid expansion? Absolutely. Um, I think that's a very important piece of this story. Um, I am also fortunate enough to live in a state where we have an enlight enlightened Republican leadership that has taken up the Medicaid expansion. And in Michigan, we expect this to provide coverage to 400,000 new Medicaid enrollees who previously would not have had insurance with significant health um, and financial benefits in terms of providing financial security. In Michigan, over the first 10 years of the expansion in, of Medicaid, because of the significant federal role in paying for the expansion, it actually reduces spending by the state. That's been shown in an analysis that we did at the University of Michigan. The uh, state um, House and Senate fiscal agencies also released an analysis showing that. So by reducing what the state has to pay, the state currently pays a lot for mental health and community health care for people who will become folded into Medicaid. And as a result, it, it lifts some of the pressing burden on the state. We can then spend more money on education or highways or any many other things that in Michigan we'd like to spend money on. All right. Mr. Renacy. <laughs> Just a few seconds. Mr. Levy, what was the situation with mental patients before uh, oh, the when they were not covered by Medicaid? Well, the state spends a considerable amount of money on um, community mental health spending, so uh, mental health care that's provided through public clinics. Uh, those patients would now have access through Medicaid um, to other providers, and the state's commitments through the community mental health system are reduced. All right, Mr. Na thank you. Mr. Renacci is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to <clears throat> thank the witnesses uh, today also. You know, as a business owner for approximately three decades, I often uh, wondered why some of this legislation would come out of Washington, and then I realized that many times legislation comes out of Washington by people who have never had to live with it. But as a small business owner for almost three decades, I had to. And I understand the struggles that small business owners are going through on a day-to-day -day basis, especially with the ACA and with the our requirements, and I also realize that every day they have to make decisions on whether they lay people off, whether they can, are going to add people, what are they going to do next. Um, and I also, coming from uh, Ohio, Cleveland, Akron, Canton area, get the opportunity to go back on a weekly basis. So I'm talking to these people, and it is shocking when I hear um, many of my colleagues on the other side say this isn't affecting some of these people. So. Let me just give you some examples in my district and in, my, in the Cleveland, Canton, Akron area um, of what's going on with the hours and the uh, Affordable Care Act. The Cleveland Clinic, which is ranked among the top four hospitals, um, has announced layoffs of employees as a direct result of the Affordable Care Act. Summa Health Systems laid off 58 workers in September and another 25 in December. Um, 
Akron General Health System, Summit County's second largest employer, laid off 132 workers in February and another 30 in September. The city of Akron, the city of Medina, the city of Fairlawn, the city of Talmadge, the city of Westlake are limiting part-timers to fewer than 30 hours per week. Cuyahoga County Community College capped hours for 1,559 part-timers at 20 hours per week. Kent State University limited course load of adjunct faculty. Medina City Schools cut weekly hours for cafeteria workers and teachers' aides from 30 to 28 hours per week. Stark State College capped hours of adjunct faculty at 29 hours per week. University of Akron cut course loads for part-time faculty. A local tavern in Canton, Ohio, saw a 32% increase in its projected premiums after the employer mandate was delayed. If their premiums increase again, they will have to look at a reduction in workforce or stop providing health insurance to their employees. Claudia uh, from Cleveland wrote and cons is concerned over losing her employer-sponsored health coverage. After previously being laid off from a full-time job, she accepted a part-time job at a J.C. Penney's that offered her affordable health care. However, her employer has now stopped offering insurance for part-time employees due to the ACA. John from Wadsworth, a small business owner, he wrote to tell me that he will not be able to offer insurance in the future due to increased costs as a direct result of the ACA. You know, but most recently, and this is what's, when I say I go back and I hear a woman working at the counter at a local restaurant in my hometown said to me, Congressman, I've been here for 22 years. I've worked 32 to 35 hours per week. I love my job. I enjoy my job. Now, because of the ACA and the skyrocketing costs, we've been told that all of our staffing will be reduced to approximately 28 hours per week. That's a, approximately a 15 to 17 percent pay cut, plus she's going to lose her health insurance. So now she said to me, I have to go on the Affordable Care Act. She looked at me. She said, I'm scared. She says, can you help me? Can you t overturn this law? These are the kind of things that you hear when you go back to the district. But when I'm in Washington and I hear some of my colleagues, I never hear that. But this is what you actually hear when you're dealing with these people and, and, you're, and you're back there listening to them. It's amazing. Um, you know, I worked in the healthcare care industry uh, most of my career. I had nursing homes. And I saw your statistics on how they're going to be affected. I think of those over 1,000 employees that I employed. Um, and look at those nursing assistants, many of them single moms, 35 hours per week that earned approximately $411. If the nursing assistant hours are cut back to 29 hours, he or she would lose $71 per week or equivalent of 17% pay cut. That's unheard of when we're thinking of these single mothers and fathers that are trying to provide um, for their family. I go back to certainty and predictability, and I would ask this general question. As a business owner, you need certainty and predictability. I would ask all the panel members, do you believe the ACA in this hour situation brings certainty and predictability to the small business owner? Uh, absolutely not, Congressman. No, not at all. No, sir. No, sir. But your large business owners, for small business owners, now their workers can get health insurance from another source if they have to. Can I just say, uh, Senator, can I just say one thing? I mean, yes, uh, Senator, I'm sorry, Representative. Um, that's it. We're, we're large business owners. I mean, that, that is, there's large business owners like general corporations, Wall Street and such, and then there's small business owners like us, and, that, and that's a big difference. And I might I just add, the, the hardest thing to understand here is this, this idea that for, uh, the change in the rule to 40 hours is going to cause more, certainly there are more people closer to 40 hours. But as somebody who's worked many years on the floor by the hour, I would much rather lose one hour of pay, go from 40 to 39 than 40 to 29. Thank you. All right. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Chairman. And again, panel, thank you for being here. Um, I know that sometimes we talk about, well, these are just anecdotal, but I, I also, like Mr. Renacci, Mr. Young, Mr. Griffin, people back home, Barbara Wilson works for the ARC of Mercer County, Pennsylvania. This is a phenomenal organization that assists people with developmental disabilities. Barbara is a part-time employee who used to work 30 to 35 hours a week. Now, she was recently informed and her co-workers that all part-time employees will be having their hours cut to around 20 hours a week because of the Affordable Care Act. Barb tells me that she was shocked when she heard this news because of her hours being cut. 
she says she would no longer be able to afford the cost of living. Now, let me tell you, there's also a lot of private uh, companies I've talked to. I think the chilling effect of this current uh, run is that these people say, you can use our story, but you can't use my name because I'm afraid of some type of a, of a retribution. And so, Mr. Yannis, uh, thanks for being here. I know it's tough, and I, and I have people back home that tell me, look, at, how about a guy, uh, 92 of his 993 employees work more than 30 hours a week. Now all 92 of those employees have had their hours cut to less than 30 hours a week. On top of that, more than 30 employees have had access to their health insurance plans ended. Now, it's not only affecting the private sector, also the public sector. In our school district, where I come from, Butler Area School District, has had to implement procedures to keep all of its part-time employees working less than 30 hours. In the entire Lawrence County uh, government has had to reduce all of its part-time em employees to just 28 hours. The purpose of this meeting today was to examine the impact of going from 40 hours to 30 hours, and I think it's absolutely ridiculous for anybody to say there is no impact. I am a small-time time, small businessman. We spend about $400,000 a year on health care. Now, Mr. Ansos, if you could just relate, because I don't think people get the picture of your total cost of labor and what this adds to your total cost of labor and how that affects your final product that you have to put out in the market and compete against every single person that does what you do. So when you talk about it, also talk about Social Security contributions about, and your wage taxes and, and about Medicaid uh, prop, uh, 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 contributions. It's a lot more than people think. I know in our place, Somebody comes to me and says, we need to hire this person. I say, fine, do you know what it's going to cost us? And they say, this is what we'll be paying them per hour. I said, that's not my total cost. You can add about 40% to that with wage taxes and benefits. So would you just talk a little bit about that? Because you do it every day. You have to cut checks that you sign the front of, not the back of. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative. It, it, it does add about 40%. It, it, well, it adds quite a bit. I'd have to look at it to see exactly what it costs, and it's at different levels for different amounts. But, of course, the thing about health insurance is that if you have people that are you're paying $12 an hour, it's a much bigger percentage that it adds to it all the time. And, and, and like I said, we're small businesses in America. I mean, we may be large and considered over 50, but at the same time, I mean, to, to expect us to, to do two and a half times our health care costs and then expect – and say that, you know, that we're, we're large businesses and therefore don't we want to cover everybody? Well, of course you do. Yeah. But at the same time, you can't, you can't, you, the survivability of business is first and foremost. Yeah, and, 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 and Dr. Chen, this idea of the 40 hours to the 30 hours, I have no idea where this came from. I also wonder how it would impact, or impact overtime pay. Uh, what are we going to use now as a, as a definition for when we go to overtime? 40s to 30, we have no idea how this came about. I mean, why did it come about? How did we change from 40 to 30? Anybody know? Well, it certainly doesn't match precedent that we have in the Fair Labor Standards Act, which sets 40 hours as the uh, threshold for the payment of non-exempt employees to have them uh, receive overtime pay. So th this is inconsistent with that and one of the reasons why it raises uh, employer costs. Okay, well, then here's my question. Because I know we're, we're watching now. Since we've cut the, the work week from 40 hours a week to 30 hours a week, that's about a 25% reduction in the number of hours. So using the president's terminology, look, it's – just arithmetic. So if I cut your hours by 25%, then I'm going to have to raise your wage by 25%. And I see this pivot to the minimum wage now, which kind of, it's, it's kind of funny how it kind of matches the 25% less hours, matched by a 25% increase in the minimum wage that the government wants to establish. I think that's a Judas goat that's making people to think that, okay, we're going to raise your wage. I don't believe that that's the right approach to this. And so, uh, Chairman, I thank you so much for holding this committee. This is not a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. This is an American worker issue. Listen, when, when Mr. Hoffa jumps on this and says you're destroying the backbone of, a, of the American middle class, then there's a concern. This effect this is a very chilling effect, and I really am concerned about the gap now that's widening between what the people have faith and trust in and what we're coming out with policy wise. Mr. Anastos, thanks for being here. Mr. Snyder, thank you. Mr. Troutwine, Ms. Dr. Levy, Dr. Chen, thank you for being here. But I have a greater concern today, really better be, how we're destroying the American people's confidence in the government that continues to come out with policies that destroy our middle class and then somehow come out with another narrative and say, no, no, that's not the problem. The problem is we're just not paying enough at the minimum level. It should never be a minimum wage that we, that we try to get to. It should be a market wage where we allow all workers with their skills and their ability to make as much as they can. So thank you all for being here. Mr. Right, Chairman, thank you. thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Jenkins is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, too, thank the panel. You've had a long day. 
Uh, during my short time on this committee, there have been countless hearings on the President's health care law. Just last spring, the committee had the opportunity to question Secretary Sebelius about the progress of the law, and she informed us that everything was proceeding according to schedule. Then in July, of course, the President decided to delay enforcement of the employer mandate until 2015. This was a surprising but welcome retreat. I think the witnesses here today have demonstrated this. Uh, this delay, unfortunately, is only a temporary relief for employees and employers. This fall, employers will have to make a very difficult decision regarding the health care coverage and full-time status of their employees, and these decisions will ultimately hurt employees, not employers. I have a letter here from a Kansan, John Rolfe, who operates 64 restaurants across the Midwest and several in my congressional district, and I'd request, Mr. Chairman, that this letter be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Rolf here, whose uh, restaurants employ hundreds of people, he has made a good faith effort in the past to provide all employees with a modest health insurance plan and will continue this effort by complying with the employer mandate in 2015. Additionally, he has made the decision not to cut his employees' hours below the 30 in order to avoid the mandate. This means that he will continue to offer health care coverage for those folks even though it will be more than more expensive than his old plans that were canceled. This is nothing short of admirable and is representative of the strong relationships that many employers and employees share all over the nation. However, Mr. Roth worries that the 30-hour definition for, for full-time employees could have adverse consequences for companies in this situation. Because his employees tend to work more than 30 hours a week and are offered a health plan, their options are either to take this more expensive health plan or search for a plan on healthcare.gov where they will no longer be eligible for a subsidy. Mr. Rolf worries that many of these employees will actually request to work fewer than 30 hours a week so that they will not be offered health insurance by the company and can obtain subsidies over the exchange. And I doubt these are the outcomes the President envisioned when he put pen to paper on this law. But the sad reality is his health care law will encourage many Americans to be only part-time employees, which will make it increasingly difficult for many of them to achieve the American dream. Mr. Anastos, I feel that your testimony uh, really reflected the comments of Mr. Rolfe and others uh, of my constituency. As somebody in the hospitality industry, do you uh, have comments uh, regarding how true uh, this letter is? Uh, yes, Congresswoman, uh, I, that letter is right on the money. I think Congressman Reed had similar comments uh, that I thought were right on the money. And, you know, a couple of things about it. it to me, it's almost hurts the I, – you know, I have to look at it from the employer's side. But, um, like I said, I mean, I've worked on factory floors and that sort of thing for many years. And I actually think it – I truly think it hurts the worker more than it hurts us because they're the ones who are going to – with a – they're going to be have their hours knocked down by a significant amount. And secondly, that whole idea about the relationship between us small employers or even large employers and our employees, it just creates this wedge and uh, division that is just totally unnecessary. And um, it, it's, it's, I, I just certainly reemphasize everything that that gentleman said. Mr. Chen, would you care to comment on uh, if you agree that this provision will uh, disproportionately hurt the employee? There's no question that the biggest loser from this is the employee, particularly the vulnerable population we've talked about today that we look at in our research and others have looked at as well. Um, you're talking about millions of Americans who will be adversely impacted because the incentives created by the law, frankly, are perverse. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman.
All right, thank you very much. And I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. And I would appreciate your continued assistance uh, in getting answers to the questions that were asked by the committee. Uh, as a reminder, any member wishing to submit a question for the record will have 14 days to do so. And if any members submit questions after this hearing, I would ask the witnesses, witnesses to respond in a timely manner. Thank you very much. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.